So, what exactly is this place called again? Theo looked around the passenger seat to shoot me a slightly annoyed gaze as the SUV drove up the empty two-lane road, jostling slightly as the truck hit a pothole. Dude, exactly how wasted were you last night? I told you the beach and the park have virtually the same name. Birch Point Beach in Birch Point Beach State Park. Duh. I snorted back at my friend, smirking and flipping him the bird before returning to gently massaging my temples. For a few more moments, the world tilted slightly. Then it seemed to pass, allowing me to let out a small sigh of relief. I'm originally from New England, having been born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. When I had graduated high school, I decided that I didn't want to spend my entire life living in the same area that I had been born in. And so, setting my wings, I set out to find a place that I could carve out as my own. Eventually, I settled across the country in eastern Washington and started my own construction business. I made good money and I also made plenty of new friends, but I couldn't help but miss home at times. I would go back during the holidays to spend them with my mother, but aside from that, I never really went back. Until I got a phone call from my old pal, Theo. Dude, you have seriously got to take a break from work and come stay with me and Vaughn for a week at his parents' old summer home in Owl's Head. In any other situation, especially with clients breathing down me and my employees' necks, I would have declined. But the call came just after my girlfriend had told me that she was splitting for me. So, wanting some time to unwind and get away from it, along with life in general. I left my assistant in charge and boarded a plane for Maine the very next day. And now here I was, crumpled in the back seat of the 1986 Jeep Grand Wagoneer that Vaughn had inherited from his parents, heading for some place that I had never heard of before. The throbbing feeling returned, and I let out a soft groan before putting my head in my hands. You're 34 years old, Evan, and you just spent last night getting wasted to the gills at a rage you're like you're still in your early 20s. And to top it off, you're running on just like 5 hours of sleep. That, if you look it up in the dictionary, is the textbook definition of the word stupid. Something hard gently bumped into the top of my head, and I looked up to see Theo holding out a bottle of Powerade. I took it gratefully, uncapping it and taking a swig. You look like crap warmed over, you know that, right? He asked, finally letting loose with a smile of his own. The cold drink felt amazing going down my throat, driving away some of the dehydration that I felt and fueling my retort. Well, then I look just like I feel. Although, with the bags under your eyes, you won't need to make much of a Halloween costume this year to take your little sister trick-or-treating. Vaughn suddenly let out a loud bark of laughter from the driver's seat, causing both of us to jump slightly. Ouch, dude, you just got burned as something spectacular, Theo. He looked away from the road long enough to shoot a grin at him. You're gonna need some aloe vera for that one. Theo rolled his eyes at the lame joke, but it caught me off guard enough that I began snickering. He was about to say something when Vaughn interrupted him. They were here. I pulled myself up slightly from the leather seat to stare out the windshield. He was right. Ahead of us lay a medium-sized parking area that stretched out in a rectangle. I noted with a slight interest that there were only one or two other cars here. As if sensing my gaze, Vaughn spoke again. Not many people come here this early in the morning. They're down in town having breakfast or they're still sleeping. I let out a grunt in reply as he pulled into an empty space and parked. For a few moments, the three of us simply sat in the truck, listening to the call of birds filtering in through the closed windows as the sky became lighter, hinting that dawn was just about to break. Then Theo spoke up. Well, let's hit it, gentlemen. And with that, he unbuckled his seatbelt, pushed open the door and hopped out, slamming it shut behind him. I let out another soft groan as the sound reverberated in my head, making my ears begin to ring like I had a bad case of tinnitus. 
Vaughn looked around at me, a small look of concern on his face. Sure you're okay, Evan? I took a deep breath, blinking my eyes a few times before answering. Yeah, I think so, just drank a little bit too much last night. My head feels like I just got off the old tilt-a-whirl at Kenobi Lake Park. He let out a soft chuckle. Well, you kinda went a bit overboard last night, bro. His face turned back from amused to concerned. I tell you what, when we get to the beach, you can crash on the towel for a bit. Sound copacetic. I nodded, feeling thankful that out of the two of my friends, Vaughn was the one who always had looked after us. He had since we had been kids. He reached over and patted me on the shoulder. Hey, come on before Theo gets impatient and pissy. Then together we pushed open our respective doors and stepped out. The cool breeze felt like a godsend against my brow and I inhaled deeply, smiling at the ocean breeze which invaded my nostrils. Ah, the smell of the ocean. It invigorated me a bit and I strode around to the back of the jeep, where Vaughn was lowering the tailgate to retrieve the bag of towels and water that he had tossed in earlier. After shutting the tailgate again and letting the rear window roll back up, he pulled the key out and motioned for us to follow him. For a few minutes, we walked in peaceful silence, the only sounds heard being the birds in the trees around us and the growing crash of waves against the shore. Then the trees parted, allowing us our first glimpse of the place that we had been brought to. Theo let out an awestruck laugh. Holy crap, V, you've been holding out on us. The beach looked nothing less than something that you would find in the front of a postcard, which you would send back home to make people jealous of your trip. It stretched out to either side of us in a sort of crescent moon shape, the rocky ground giving way to sand that led to the water's edge. Vast swaths of pine and fir trees encircled the entire beach, looking very much like sentries guarding a hoard of treasure, and the smell of pine needles intermingled with the ocean spray. The seagulls cried from overhead, and I turned my gaze to look out to sea. The sun was just beginning to rise on the horizon, and the dark shapes of what I realized were the Muscle Ridge Islands were framed in its glow. I let out a soft laugh of my own. Dude, this is fantastic. How the heck is in this place more known? Vaughn began walking towards the sand the two of us following along. It's always managed to fly just under the radar of most tourists. He called over his shoulder to me. They prefer going to the huge beaches down in York. And that means this place stays a small slice of paradise for the locals. Like me. He dropped the tote bag on the sand, reaching in and pulling out two bottles of water, which he handed to us as another grin began to spread across his face. And for the next hour or two, we have the entire place to ourselves. Theo let out a whoop at the news, one which made me wince slightly as it echoed in my head, but I couldn't help but give a grin of my own. Regardless of how you feel, this place is dope. A sudden burst of movement caused me to swing my head around, just in time to see Theo begin sprinting for the water. The last one ends a plucked turkey, he shouted, pulling off his shirt and throwing it behind him. Vaughn shook his head and turned, giving me a slightly amused smile. I let out a snort of my own. Every fish and crab in the bay is going to think that he's absolutely Jim Dandy when he hits the water and stirs up the bottom. I muttered, causing him to chuckle. Now you ain't joking, man. I took another swig of water before dropping the bottle on the sand. Crossing my arms over my head, I began to wrestle my shirt off. Dude, I told you when we got here that you could crash on the towel for a little bit. I heard him say. I finally freed myself from the shirt, casting it to the sand next to the bottle. If I don't at least take a dip in along with you guys... I'll never hear the end of it from him. I hooked a thumb at the figure which was now beginning to splash around in the shallow water like he was a little kid again. I'll humor him with a few minutes of swimming, and then hop out and lay on the towel for a bit. Besides, swimming in the oceans always helped clear my head. 
He looked like he wanted to argue again, being the older brother type, but instead nodded before pulling his shirt off as well. I raised you to the water then, he asked me and I nodded. A second later, the two of us took off. The cool wind whipped in my ears and I vaguely heard Theo egging us on. But my gaze was focused on the shoreline, pouring all the power that I could muster into my legs as I awkwardly ran in the sand. My head began to spin again and I silently prayed that I wouldn't suddenly pass out and fall on my face. This is so freaking stupid, but there's no turning back now. And then I reached the water's edge. Even in the middle of summer, the Atlantic Ocean felt absolutely breathtaking in how chilly it was. Holy crap, it's cold. I involuntarily yelled out, but I kept going. Running until the water reached my knees where I launched myself forward. The cold water felt shocking as it completely enveloped me, and I couldn't help but shudder as my body slid through the water. My eyes pulled tightly shut to prevent the seawater from stinging them. My head breached the surface and I sputtered out as I heard a disappointed cry. Oh, dang it, Evan. Even hung over, you can still kick my butt. I pushed the hair out of my eyes and turned back to find Vaughn standing in the waist deep water grinning at me. I guess I still got it, was all that I said. Theo slapped me on the back congratulating me, and then he turned and began swimming around, laughing as he would dive underwater and surface a few moments later. I shook my head as my feet touched the bottom and I stood up. Another wave of the hangover hit me hard and I closed my eyes for a moment to center myself. It was a bit hard to do with the water gently rising and falling around me in rhythm with the pounding in my head. You all right, man? I opened my eyes to see Vaughn gazing at me, even more concerned than he had been before. At this time, I didn't blame him. This truly was a stupid idea. I swallowed before answering. No, I think so. I'm just gonna go wait around for a few minutes and then pop out on the towel and lay down for a bit. My friend nodded, and then gestured to the pair of legs now sticking out of the water. And go on, I'll keep an eye on this numbskull to make sure that he doesn't hurt himself. Nodding, I turned away and waited towards the left side of the beach, making sure to keep the point of my vision so I wouldn't accidentally wait out too far. The waves gently slapped my body and as I drew further away from the hooting and hollering behind me, I began to feel a little bit better. Being in nature had always worked as a sort of natural healing cell for me, and this was no exception. I gazed down into the water looking at the shimmering world that my legs walked through. A rather annoyed crab scuttled out of my way as I approached, raising its claws as if challenging me to a duel. I chuckled softly. Not today, buddy. I'm nowhere near in the mood. A few small fish darted about just ahead of me, before streaking between my legs and out into deeper water. The distant crash of the waves on the rocky shoreline further out completed the idyllic, peaceful scene, and I felt my pounding head lessen slightly. That was when the feeling came over me. To this very day, I can't fully describe what it was. All I know is one moment I was feeling content. The next, it was like a lightning bolt had gone up my spine. The shiver that coursed through me was stronger and more noticeable than I had ever had before in my life, and it caused me to freeze in place. My head snapped up and I looked around me. Aside from the gently lapping waves, nothing disturbed the water around me. I shot a gaze behind me. Vaughn and Theo were still at the other end of the beach, now engaged in some sort of diving competition. Neither one was paying attention to me. Then what the heck was that, I wondered. Another feeling washed over me, this time much easier to distinguish, though far less welcome. It was the feeling of being watched, being stared at. Having had to dodge more than a few sketchy people every time that I had to travel to Seattle for meetings with clients, it was a feeling that I knew all too well. I had learned how to distinguish the difference between a pair of benevolent eyes watching me, and those with, well, shall we say, more malicious intentions in mind. This feeling was firmly in the latter category. 
My gaze suddenly swept up towards the tree line. I remembered seeing the two other cars in the parking lot, and my mind began to conjure up the image of someone standing just inside the tree line, watching us like a scene from a horror movie. But nobody stood staring at us. Not that I could see anyways. But still, the feeling persisted, almost seeming to grow in intensity a little. I gave my head a shake. Get a grip, dude. Nobody's watching you. Nobody else is here. Wanting to take my mind off of it, I instead turned and looked ahead of me down into the water. The light-colored sand and pebbles stretched away for another 15 or 20 feet. And then the bottom changed to a slightly darker color, looking a little bit covered with muck and seaweed indicating the slope which led out to deeper water. But for a moment, I simply stared at it, my head slightly tilting to the side. Something was scratching at the back of my mind very faintly, but I couldn't understand what it was. Why does that look weird to me? Nausea suddenly slammed into me and the dizziness returned with a vengeance. I felt bile rise in my throat and I turned away from the spot, rushing to get out of the water. Emerging onto the beach, I raced up towards the trees, hearing Vaughn vaguely call my name, but I was focused on one thing only. I reached the first tree and I leaned against it, taking a single breath before vomiting onto the ground. For a minute, I just leaned against the tree and threw up. The pounding in my head sprang up and I fought for breath against the sting of my stomach acid in my mouth and throat. The world began to spin and I thought that I would faint where I stood. Dude, holy crap. I turned, seeing Theo and Vaughn standing next to me. Vaughn pulled me away from the tree and gently began guiding me back towards the tote bag. Come on, man, you need to lie down, he said. Reaching our stuff, he signaled for Theo to lay out one of the towels and then slowly eased me down to sit on it. He picked up my shirt from the sand, shaking it off and handing it to me. Put this on and try to relax, he said, before looking up at Theo. He ain't going back in the water, bro. Last night really did a number on him. I heard Theo let out a slightly disappointed sigh. Uh, sure, whatever. He used to be able to hold his drink a lot better than this man. Well, that's because I gave up the party life and grew up unlike you. I thought, but I kept my mouth shut. Pulling my shirt over my head, I laid down on the towel so that I could look out at the dark water. Vaughn spoke again, slightly annoyed by our friend's tone. Look, he needs to rest. You can go back in the water if you want, but keep an eye on him. Where the heck are you going? Theo asked. I'm going to go take a quick hike up on the trails to cool off. Especially after that little quip you made about our friend. I began to close my eyes. Sleep was calling my name and she was insistent about it this time. I heard Vaughn walk away muttering to himself. Theo appeared in the narrow band of my vision. He looked down at me, a slightly guilty expression on his face. And then he leaned down and patted my shoulder. I feel better, bro, he said softly. I grunted in reply as he turned to run back to the water. As I stared at the ocean, the feeling that I had had while waiting had returned to me, this time dulled by the encroaching sleep. For a moment, I realized that it almost felt like something had told me not to keep moving forward. But a new feeling poked its head out, one that I couldn't place, but it was just as quickly chased away. I heard Theo splashing, signaling that he had re-entered the water. My eyes closed. For a small time, I lay in a sort of half-awake, half-asleep state, listening to the sounds of the gulls overhead and the splashing of my friend in the water. The rising sun felt warm against my wet skin. There was suddenly a single splash louder than the others, almost pulling me back to the waking world. And then it was quiet and peaceful. A small smile crossed my face. The next thing I knew, I was being shaken awake. For a few moments, I attempted to resist as I had been in the middle of a very pleasant dream. But the shaking remained insistent and I gradually became aware of a voice calling my name. Evan, wake up man, please. I let out a grunt, signaling that I was awake as I rolled over onto my back. 
the voice came again. Come on, buddy, you need to wake up. I finally cracked my eyes open, jarring them shut against the blinding sun. I'm awake, I muttered, pulling myself into a sitting position. My head still throbbed, though not as much as it had before. Something was placed into my hand and after a moment of feeling, I realized it was a pair of sunglasses. Flipping them open and sliding them on, I was finally able to open my eyes. Vaughn stood above me, looking around in almost a frantic motion. When he looked down at me, I snapped fully awake as I caught sight of the expression adorning his face. He looked beyond worried. Dude, what is it? I asked. Did you happen to see Theo leave the beach or hear him say anything about going anywhere? His question made me rise to my feet on slightly shaky legs. I looked around. The beach, aside from the two of us, was completely deserted. Nobody played in the water and nobody moved in the woods behind us. The heck? No, I finally answered. No, I didn't. The last thing that I remember was him running back to the water after you took off. I heard him splashing around and then I fell asleep. Oh, great, Vaughn muttered and then gestured down. Well, he couldn't have gone that far. He left his shirt and shoes here. He was right. Theo's converses and t-shirt still lay where he had dropped them. My mind began to turn faster and faster. I looked at my friend. Could he have gone back to the jeep for something? A look of relief suddenly flashed in his eyes. Uh, come on, let's go quickly look. And with that, he led the way back up the trail, walking slowly so that I could keep up. The dizziness hadn't fully gone away, but at least I felt confident that I wouldn't pass out now. I felt sure that we would round the corner and see our friend rifling through the truck for something. We did leave our phones in the jeep anyways. But as we rounded the last bend and the parking lot came into view, that hope was torn from me like a fish in a shark's mouth. The jeep sat silently where we had parked it. The door is still locked. Crap! Vaughn hissed as he stopped for a moment. A rustling sound suddenly came from the direction of one of the trailheads and we looked up, half expecting to see him, but instead a stranger walked out of the woods in hiking attire. He cast us a look as he walked to his car and got in, starting the engine and driving away. Vaughn cursed again. Come on, we need to get back to the beach and try to find him. I agreed and the two of us half walked, half ran back to the beach. The slight annoyance that I had, had towards Theo when I had woken up had now been replaced by a slight worry. The guy can be a complete jack at times and he can also be a bit self-centered but he's still my friend. We burst back out into the sunlight and looked around the empty beach. Nothing had changed since we left. Let's check the woods around the edge and the oceanside trails and then we come back here. I said, offering a plan. He nodded and looked at me. You get to check the right side on your own for a few minutes. I nodded and he patted my shoulder before taking off towards the left side of the beach. Turning towards the right, I did the same. For what my waterproof watch told me was 10 minutes, but felt more like an eternity. My walk through the trees and along the trails, calling out Theo's name. I could hear Vaughn doing the same. The faint sound of his call drifted across the mouth of the bay. Finally, I made my way to the beach, the worry intensifying from finding no sign of him. God, I hope he didn't do something monumentally dumb and hurt himself. Vaughn met me by the towels. I shook my head as he raised his hands to me. He let out a loud sigh as I stood next to him. I didn't find him either, he simply said, and then began rubbing the back of his neck a trademark sign that he was beginning to stress out. Tell me again the last thing you remember seeing of him. He asked me and I took a deep breath and spoke. Like I said, man, I remember him leaning over me after you had gone. He leaned down and told me to feel better and then I heard him run back to the water. I heard him splashing around for a minute and then I heard a loud splash and then... I trailed off as something began to connect in my mind. The jigsaw pieces came together quickly, and I felt a shiver shoot up my spine as the realization hit me. 
my heart began to beat hard in my chest and I felt the blood begin to drain out of my face as a wave of dread has surged into me. Oh crap. Vaughn had caught sight of my face and he grabbed my shoulder to study me. What Evan, then what? My eyes locked with his. I heard a loud splash and then nothing. Silence. My friend's face suddenly went as pale as mine must to have looked as he realized what I was saying, and both of our gazes swung towards the water. The waves lapped it gently on the shore and no sign of movement came from it. He finally spoke, his voice barely above a whisper. Oh God. And then the two of us began running for the water, shouting Theo's name. Neither one of us bothered to pull off our shirts. We hit the water hard. I nearly tripped as a particularly large swell that smacked me in the knees and I swung my gaze around seeing nothing. The mental image of my friend's drowned body hovering just above the sandy bottom flashed in my mind's eye for a moment, and I pushed it away as another wave of fear rolled into me. You gotta keep calm, man. You gotta stay calm. A hand fell on my shoulder and I turned, stabbing myself out of my thoughts to see Vaughn beside me his face now set in steely determination. We've got to split up and search. He pointed to the farthest right side of the bay. You take that side and keep calling out to me every so often, whether you find him or not, and I'll do the same over here. I nodded, forcing myself to stay as calm as possible as I watched him turn away, lifting his arms out of the water as he began heading towards the other side. I gazed after him for another moment and then turned him again moving in the opposite direction. My eyes aided by the sunglasses that I still had on stared down into the water, rapidly looking to the left and to the right, but I saw nothing but sand and rocks. You find anything? I heard Vaughn call out behind me. Nothing yet. My eyes flickered towards the darker shade of the deeper water. He could have easily been pulled out to the sea by the tide. After all, you have no idea if there's a riptide in the bay. That thought scared me more than anything. I could easily imagine Theo's corpse adrifting in the dark, like the body in the underwater scene from the TV show The Terror. I was beginning to chide myself again when I felt my foot collide with something, something that half rose out of the bottom kicking up a large cloud of silt and sand. I could tell by the feeling of it against my foot that it wasn't anything natural. My breath quickened a bit and I forced myself to stoop down, my hand disappearing into the cloud as I felt around it. My chin was touching the water and I shot my eyes around as I felt my fingers close around it. The same odd feeling that I had had earlier returned. I still couldn't tell what it was. But with every fiber of my being on alert, it felt amplified and thoroughly unpleasant. I stood back up, pulling what I had uncovered out of the water. A small wave of confusion passed over me as I stared, watching the water drain out of it. What the heck? It was a man's shoe. One of these slip-on types that you would see people wearing while aboard yachts. It clearly had been sitting on the bottom for a long time. A slimy covering of muck and algae stuck to the top and the color had begun fading. My gaze looked down into the water to see if its twin lay on the bottom. There was nothing else there. Why didn't the person retrieve their shoe if they lost it? I shook my head suddenly. I needed to focus. Theo's life might depend on it. If he's even still alive... Vaughn called out again. Hey, what'd you find? I turned to see him looking back at me. Nothing of his, just an old shoe. Keep looking. He nodded at me and turned back. I turned, giving the shoe a last look before letting it slip back below the waves. I watched it sink to the bottom and then I moved forward again. I had only gone another 15 feet when I heard a loud splash come from somewhere behind me and then nothing. I called out. Hey, did you find him? No answer. Hey Vaughn, did you find anything? Still nothing. 
Another shiver suddenly rolled up my spine and I turned, beginning to call out again. Dude, did you find- Vaughn was gone. For a moment, my brain short-circuited, trying to process what I was seeing. What the- I whispered, and my brain suddenly computed, and I realized that he must have dived underwater for something. A heavy pit settled in my stomach as I realized that he might have found our friend, and I prepared myself to see him surface, carrying Theo's body. But nobody broke the gently rolling swells. I looked at my watch, seeing that a minute had passed since he had disappeared. Vaughn? I called out. My voice seemed to echo off the trees and the bay itself, but nobody answered me. I called out again. Vaughn! And then I suddenly felt my heart begin to race again as a new wave of fear had surged into me. What happened to him? I began to move towards the left, keeping in line with where I had last seen him. The largest swell yet smacked into me and I waited as fast as I could go. I suddenly imagined that there was a sharp drop off and that both of my friends had accidentally fallen into it, getting caught in a riptide which pulled them out to sea into the bottom. My heart was pounding like a drum in my chest and I was close to hyperventilating. Finally, I reached where I swore he had been and I looked around. I was standing in water up to my chest and even with the shirt on, I was beginning to shiver. Nothing moved and I saw no sign of my friend anywhere. And that was when something caught my eye beneath the waves. I turned, trying to distinguish what it was but the swells had become a bit fiercer, distorting everything. I took a step forward, squinting my eyes. It remained elusively out of focus, though I could tell that it did not belong, looking much brighter than the surrounding sand. Another step forwards and it became a little clearer, though still unrecognizable. Another large swell smacked into me, and I took a third step forwards. That's when the same feeling that I had had earlier slammed into me like a Kenworth. The same lightning bolt shot on my spine and I froze. I realized that I had reached the same place that I had had it before as well. As much as I tried forcing myself to move forwards, it was as if some primitive part of my brain refused to allow my body to do so. Finally, I decided to quickly duck under the water to see what I had spotted. Leaving the sunglasses on, I took a deep breath and slipped beneath the waves. The salt water stung my eyes as I forced them open. The shapes distorted, but much easier to see than from above. I turned to look in the direction that I had, seeing it much clearer now. What was that? I allowed myself to float a little closer. The object came into focus. I froze like a statue. For a moment, I wasn't able to move, my eyes locking onto it, my brain trying to comprehend what it was and simultaneously trying to refuse. The feeling that I had felt again returned with a vengeance, along with a new emotion, horror. I shot up, my head breaking the water as I sputtered it from my mouth and felt my heart thunder in my chest. My eyes widened as I slowly began to back away, locking on to what I recognize now. It was a human leg. And to be more specific, it was Vaughn's leg. The tattoo wrapped around the ankle was proof of that. It lay on the bottom and from what I saw, it ended by the upper thigh. My eyes flashed around looking frantically at the water around me. Fear like I had never felt before crashed into me in bigger and bigger waves. A shark. There's a shark in here and it just killed both my friends. The thought spurred me to take another step backwards. As I did, the thought occurred to me to look for any pools of blood. The last thing that I wanted to do was accidentally step into one. I looked back at the leg, my eyes following up the calf to the knee to the... The leg moved. I froze again. What? For a moment I stared, wondering if it was an involuntary twitch. But then the leg began to thrash, kicking out hard almost frantically. There was no way that it would be able to do that unless it was still attached to the body. My eyes again moved up the leg towards the thigh, and I suddenly felt as if the wind had been knocked out of me. 
Vaughn's leg disappeared into the mucky bottom of the bay. As I stared, something began to take shape, something that my eyes had not caught before. And I felt a new wave of horror and dread hit me as I realized what I was seeing. A line in the muck, one that seemed about three or four feet across, one that I realized had teeth poking out from either side of it. Sharp, translucent, needle-like teeth. That wasn't the thing that made me want to scream though. Two eyes stared out at me from just above it, ones that almost perfectly blended in with the bottom, if not for the black pupils that gazed coldly up at me. The line, the mouth opened slightly, and I felt a bit of suction almost pulling me off my feet. I watched, petrified as Vaughn's leg, which for a split second I saw was still attached to him, was sucked inside. The foot giving one final pathetic kick as the mouth closed over it. It was a sight that all these months later I still see in my nightmares. My body shook violently and every fiber of my being screamed at me to get out of the water. But I was literally rooted to the spot, frozen in terror. I felt like the character in a horror movie. The kind that you screamed at to move as the killer advanced on them and never moved. Something to my right caught my eye. A small movement. I turned and for a moment I didn't understand what I was seeing. And then I was suddenly racing towards the beach, the water matting and me slowing me. I felt a suction pull on my legs and a loud splash emanate from behind me but I forced myself to fight it. The water became shallow and as soon as it reached my knees I began running. A strange sound suddenly reached my ears and for a moment. My mind couldn't comprehend what it was and then I realized. Screams. My screams. It's been almost six months since I tore from the water that morning. As soon as I was free of the waves, I sprinted for the parking lot, stopping only to snatch up the keys to Vaughn's Jeep. I had been delirious as I had crashed through the bushes. According to the hiker who had found me frantically trying to unlock the driver's door, that I had barely been able to speak. But when I babbled about my friends and the water, he called the cops. When they had come, I had calmed down just enough to be able to tell them what had happened. They of course didn't believe me. They thought that I had had a mental break. They searched the beach and even bringing a diver in to check the bay, but they found nothing. No sign of Vaughn or Theo. And no monster buried in the sand and muck. Only depressions which the diver noted looked a bit unnatural. The police chalked my friend's fates up to either drowning or a shark attack. For such a small town it's surprising they didn't even make the local paper. And when Theo's girlfriend arrived when the police had called her and they barely answered any of her questions. She was forced to go through the most basic procedures before being hurried out the door. And since Vaughn's parents had died three years ago, there was nobody that they could call for him. I can only assume that the people in charge of government in Owl's Head didn't want the idea of two people dying at their secluded paradise-like beach to stain the town's reputation. As for me, as soon as I was released, I flew straight back to Washington. I tried to get back to as normal a life as possible, but it's been impossible. When I need to report to my clients in Seattle, I now video call them instead of traveling there myself. I tried one time, but as soon as my eyes spied the massive ocean stretching out away from it, I began to shake so badly that I had to pull over. I can't stand to even see the ocean anymore. Heck, I can't even stand to be near a lake, not without being reduced to a screaming, blubbering mess. I know what it was. Growing up, I had always gone to the Boston Aquarium during summer vacation with my mother. I had wanted to be a marine biologist for a time and I begged her to take me to see all the creatures that I used to adore. And I remember staring into one particular tank, watching a monstrous looking fish bury itself into the sand, waiting for prey to swim by so that it could leap up and grab them, before swallowing them whole. One that was only about three feet long, Five times smaller than the horror that I saw that day. And looking to the plaque mounted on the wall beside the glass, seeing the name. Stargazer. I suffer nightmares every single time I fall asleep. 
Nightmares of seeing my friend being eaten alive, disappearing into that mouth, one as wide as a dinner table. Nightmares of seeing those cold eyes gazing at me, eyeing me like a Thanksgiving turkey. And nightmares of turning, turning to see the second one rising from the bottom, getting ready to strike at me. The few people that I tried to tell about what I saw that day, scientists and marine biologists never believed me saying that those fish could never grow to such sizes. And now I finally decided to post what happened that day here, in a place others tell of unbelievable and terrific things that nobody believes. I don't care if nobody believes me here either. I need to warn you. Warn as many people as I can. There are horrific things that prowl the ocean. Things that scientists haven't seen yet. Things that nobody has seen yet seen and lived to tell about anyways. Even if you don't believe me, please at least be wary when you go to the beach. Be vigilant when you wade into the water to have fun with your friends or family, because it's not just the deep ocean that you should be afraid of. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. Whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you'll like, delivered right to your door. Make saving time your breeziest resolution with quick, convenient recipes. Just choose your meals and select your delivery date. HelloFresh handles the meal planning and shopping. So all that you have to do is open your weekly box of pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step -step recipes to get cooking. My favorite recipe recently has been the meatloaf with creamy thyme sauce. It's hearty and delicious, which is perfect for this time of year. To get started, go to HelloFresh.com slash MrCreepsFree and use code MrCreepsFree for free breakfast for life. That's one breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash MrCreepsFree with code MrCreepsFree. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. A man in dark sunglasses wearing an expensive black suit and carrying a fine Italian suitcase strode purposefully towards me. I could smell the Givenchy cologne radiating off of him before he reached me. The sun shone directly in my eyes as I stared at him, wondering where this would lead. Hello, soldier, he said, shaking my hand with an iron grip. I saw his freshly cut hair and the slight bulge under his shoulder where he kept his pistol. The thought came rushing into my head, unbidden, looks like a fad. Good afternoon, sir, I said, saluting him briskly. He swatted away the gesture. You don't need to do that, he said. In fact, you may be done saluting and polishing boots forever, soldier. I have a potential job offer for you if we could speak in private. What's your name? I asked. Agent Stryker, he said. And I already know yours, Sergeant Toads. I looked into his mirrored shades, wondering what hid behind them. I have a job for you, a real god-honest career. You could be done with the Marines today if you wanted. He looked over to the administrative building, the clear glass doors opening and closing as people came and went. He looked back at me, putting his hand on my shoulder in a fatherly way. So, will you listen? Yes, sir, I said and we walked into the admin building. The blast of cold air conditioning feeling like a drink of water after wandering around the desert all day. He found a small unoccupied office marked conference room and motioned me inside, closing the door behind us. I sat down in the small, poorly padded chair on one side of the wooden desk, and he took the large, leather one across from me. From my vantage point, I could still see outside. Marines passed back and forth on their way to whatever duties they needed to carry out, and support personnel came and went from the admin building and the medical ward across the street. 
They reminded me of ants constantly rushing forwards for the good of the hive. From far away, the lines of soldiers even looked like ants. So, Agent Stryker began slowly. Sergeant Jintao Toads, we finally meet. He said my name slowly, as if tasting its syllables, pondering what it could mean. You certainly are an adept soldier. You graduated in the top 5% of your class from boot camp, and your IQ test shows that you're in the top 1% of the American population. You have a bachelor's degree from UConn and also graduated at the top of your class there. Moreover, you have joined South Korean and American citizenship. I nodded at this unsurprised. This was a man who did his research. You speak fluent Korean. Yes, I said nodding. I speak Korean and English. I grew up with both of them. Oh great, he said, clapping his hands together excitedly. You are exactly what we need. I'm recruiting from the CIA and we need someone experienced and competent. Somebody who speaks the language and understands the culture. Would this mission fit you, soldier? What do you think? Uh, I don't know, I said truthfully. It felt like this entire encounter had come out of nowhere. It had an unreal quality to it. I couldn't believe the CIA actually had interest in me. You won't be alone, he said quickly. We have another more experienced agent who would accompany you. I just stayed quiet. He pulled out a contract, showing me a paragraph marked with a handwritten star. This is a one-time offer, Sergeant Toads. Either you sign now or you will never see us again. He pointed at the marked paragraph. I grabbed the contract, spinning it around and quickly reading it. The section that he had marked discussed compensation. 70k a year plus hazard pay as well as potential bonuses for dangerous assignments. This was far more than my salary as a sergeant for the marines, which was laughably small. Okay, fine, I'm in, I said smiling slightly. I shakily rose from my seat and he did the same, extending his hand. We shook and suddenly the future seemed bright, exciting, even limitless. I had 18 months of training after that and then assumed the title of Agent Toads and Operations Officer for the company. My new partner, a gruff man with a thick southern accent, didn't speak much or reveal anything about his past. For my first assignment, I was told to go to a small office on the topmost floor of the building. I walked in, seeing a man standing there next to a desk, a file in hand. I looked him up and down, seeing a muscular gym rat with blue eyes, a tan complexion and very dark hair. He didn't smile. His stony face, just observing, seemingly seeing everything. In his black suit, standing six foot three, he made an imposing figure. I'm Agent Toad, sir, I said, stepping forward to shake his hand. He quickly looked away, pretending to not notice it, and I put it down. Yeah, I know who you are, he said, and cut the sir crap. My name is Agent Hudson, or Mark. Since we'll probably be killing people together, I assume we should start on a first name basis, right? Jin Tao. A slight smile crossed his lips, a smile that didn't reach his cold and blue eyes. He had the eyes of an executioner. A shiver ran down my spine and I felt suddenly glad that this man was on my side. This here is our first assignment. Oh, it should be easy for a young hotshot like you. He pushed the folder into my chest hard. I grabbed it and he started walking out of the room. Where do we meet? I asked. He didn't even turn his head. Uh, 6 a.m. a car will be sent to your apartment. After that, uh, maybe we'll meet in hell, I don't know. He laughed at his own joke, slamming the door behind him. I pulled the rolling chair back from the desk, putting the folder down. First, I went to the break room and made myself a cup of green tea, using lots of geokuro leaves from Japan. Carrying the cup back to the office room, the fragrant steam rising from the cup, I thought of all the possibilities in that folder. It could be a mission to go to the rainforests of Central America, or the jungles of Cambodia, or the vast forests of Siberia. I opened the first page, my heart beating fast in my chest. I read through the preliminary report quickly, feeling a sense of disappointment. 
We were to go to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, more commonly called North Korea. The order said Mark and I would travel to a biological and chemical weapons facility near the Chinese border, find out as much information as we could, and travel back to the rendezvous point. It was fairly short on details from there, and I figured that I would find out more when the time came. I went back home, eating a big meal and getting some sleep, setting my alarm early so that I could shower and shave before the CIA car whisked me away, bringing me to new and exciting places. I dreamed that night of endless tundras and open oceans, and forests filled with wonder. The car showed up at exactly 6am. I saw Agent Hudson sitting in the passenger seat. An older man, probably in his 60s, sat behind the wheel. I had never seen him before, so I got in the back seat. The smell of cologne and air freshener filled the car, a pleasant combination like vanilla and flowers. I looked at the older man in the rearview mirror. He smiled at me, his dark eyes meeting mine. He stared at me for a long moment. Agent Stryker recruited you, huh? He asked, more of a statement than a question. I nodded. He's a good man, that striker. He recruited me too all those years ago. My name's Al, by the way. I'm semi-retired, but I still drive for the company. He said using the informal name for the CIA. A lot of people who worked for it simply called it the company or the agency, assuming everybody would know exactly what agency they meant. It's nice to meet you, Al, I said, feeling tired. I had taken a caffeine pill and some ginseng supplements just before I left, but the combination hadn't kicked in yet. And I looked up at Mark, who stared out the passenger side window, not speaking. Is this your first time in the DPRK? Al asked. I nodded. Boy, some crazy stuff goes down in that country. My dad was in the Korean War. Have you ever heard of a Gwishin? I had heard the term, but I didn't really know anything about it. Uh, no, I grew up in the USA, but I speak Korean. My family taught it to me, but I don't really know the urban legends, I said. His eyes narrowed as he drove down the highway towards the military airport. This is no urban legend, he said cryptically. The Gwishin is real. My dad actually saw one when he was on guard duty. Said that he was alone in the watchtower, their company had taken heavy losses. He usually had two people on guard duty, but until reinforcements arrived, he had to do it alone. He mostly just chain smoked cigarettes and drank coffee, he said. Nothing ever really happened. And then one night, something finally did, and it was in North Korea behind it. He said that he saw women walking out of the trees, each of them in a white funeral gown. They had stringy black hair covering their faces and he couldn't see their eyes. He didn't even know how they saw to move forward. Their hair went all the way down past their chest and they seemed well. Strange and human even. He called out in broken Korean, telling them that this was a military outpost and that they needed to turn around immediately. They just kept on walking, going faster and faster now, their movements jerky and unnatural. He knew something was wrong and he called for backup, turned off the safety on his gun and started to aim. He called out again, telling them that he would be forced to fire if they didn't stop immediately. They started running towards the guard tower then, a dozen of them, and as they ran, the wind blew the hair back from their faces. He saw that they had skulls beneath, grinning, bloody skulls with pieces of rotted flesh still hanging off. They were barefoot and he saw the bones in their feet from where the skin and muscle had worn away. It was eerie how they jerked and limped at such superhuman speeds, he said. So he opened fire, but they had reached the ladder of the guard tower. He shot a few, but they just kept on coming, twisting their bodies unnaturally, dark blood staining their white gowns a black color. You could see straight through some of them where the bullets had torn through their arms or legs but they seemed to feel no pain. He started to pray and he saw rotted pale hands reaching up from the ladder to the guard tower. So without thinking, he jumped. A fairly long fall, he said, but he rolled and only ended up breaking three fingers in his arm and spraining his ankle. In immense pain, he tried to run as fast as he could and then the reinforcements had arrived. 
By the time they got to the tower, they found only trails of dark, clotted blood and some stringy black hair still on the deck, right where my father had been. He stopped talking, taking the exit to the airport. The silence in the car seemed deafening. He pulled up to the gate, showing his identification. The security guard let the gate rise and radioed something from his post. Soon we were pulling up to the jet and Al was waving goodbye to Agent Hudson and me. Good luck, new blood, he said to me. And remember, my story was in some campfire make-believe. There actually are things in those woods and in that country that aren't normal. And with all their biological and chemical weapons research, it may be much, much worse now. And with that, he put his window up, turning the car around and driving away. A blur of black trim and squealing tires shining under the hot summer sun. On the flight over to China, Agent Hudson and I discussed the plan. We would sneak in through the relatively porous Chinese-North Korean border at the exact time when the guards were being changed. We had about a five minute window where the departing guard would brief the arriving guard in the station watchtower before coming back out. Moreover, we would be armed with various weapons, in addition to the Glock 30 that I always carried in my shoulder holster under my suit. On the plane, we had two Heckler and Coach HK416 rifles equipped with both fully automatic and semi-automatic switches. We had pre-filled magazines with Dum Dum special bullets that would expand upon impact and create catastrophic tissue injuries in any enemies that we encountered. In addition, we had grenades, lots of round, blue M67s that would fragment and explode across an area 40 feet wide. And we had two very small guns with special needles filled with a torfin, a quick-acting opioid usually used to sedate elephants or large mammals that would instantly put down any normal human. We also had opioid antagonists so that the person wouldn't stop breathing after receiving it. If we found any North Korean scientists or high-ranking officials and we thought that we could take them out alive, we were supposed to try using the tranquilizer gun, though this was a secondary priority. If we could get them close to the border, then a few auxiliary agents would be in place to grab the hostage from us. The North Korean border guard could be killed if the hostage was deemed valuable enough. This was all off the books, and if we were captured and tortured, the US would immediately deny any involvement or knowledge, and say that we were lone wolves or mercenaries. Before we knew it, we were landing in China, in an airfield surrounded by lush trees. A Chinese driver who didn't speak a lick of English was there waiting. He took off quickly. I looked back at the sleek metal jet, wondering if I would ever see it again. He dropped us off seemingly in the middle of nowhere. We were on a deserted, dirt road with deep potholes and large stones scattered all over. Next to us, a thick, dark green forest loomed, rising up into the mountains that stood like watching giants overhead. I knew somewhere in that mountain range the border between China and North Korea stood, and then our mission and the killing would begin. Though this happened two months ago, I still remember the eerie sensation that crawled over me then, as if my intuition knew of the horrors that I would encounter that day. We had changed into camouflage suits before leaving the plane. The patches on the cloth, shades of black green and dark green were designed to match the flora in this region. Without hesitation, Agent Hudson began to tramp off into the woods, leaving the dirt trail behind. We didn't talk on the walk. He checked an electronic compass in his pocket, seemingly adept at reading the bizarre constantly changing numbers on the screen. He would occasionally stop behind a tree, pull out the electronic compass, and then slightly change paths again. Soon, I saw a small clearing with a watchtower up ahead. Looking to my left and right from our vantage point high in the mountains, I saw more watchtowers peeking up from the North Korean terrain. They went on as far as the eye could see, spaced out in the thick forest, their tops rising above the trees like snake heads rising out of a pit. This here is the crossing point, he whispered. Be ready for anything. I nodded grimly and we walked forward. I took out my binoculars and I saw the shape of a man on top of the tower. I was about to motion to Agent Hudson, but he had already seen it. He peered through his binoculars, frowning. Should we cross if there's still somebody up there? I asked. 
I thought this was supposed to be the changing of the guard. He looked at me strangely. Look again, he whispered. I took out my binoculars and really inspected the figure, though in the dying light of the day it was hard to make out details, but after five or six seconds I had seen and realized enough. The man wearing a North Korean military uniform had been crucified against the watchtower, his eyes cut out and his skin peeled off. Someone must have skinned him alive and then put the uniform back on his body. We walked forward slowly, our rifles raised. Soon we reached the watchtower and found no one around it. We walked slowly up the stairs, making as little noise as possible, expecting an ambush. I came to the top of the tower and found the man's corpse, with thick nails driven through his wrists and ankles. He hung from the wall around the topmost room of the tower, his head drooping. I saw letters written behind him in Korean, thick lines of black paint. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. That'll be the book of Revelation, Agent Hudson started to say when the corpse twisted violently and inhaled. The muscles on his skinned body writhed as it pulled against the nails, sending thick gouts of blood streaming down from his body, snapping its teeth, its lipless mouth opening and closing with loud clacking sounds it tried to lunge at me. Instinctively, I backed away, but the nails driven deep into the thick wood had kept the corpse attached. Oh God, I whispered, pulling up my pistol and pointing it at the head of the riding body. No, Agent Hudson said, his voice fierce and commanding. Don't you fire any guns unless necessary. The sound could draw attention. It could draw the whole dang North Korean military. Just leave it there. We have a mission after all. My head seemed to clear and I put the pistol away. We walked back into the tower and started descending the stairs, the corpse still gnashing and snapping its teeth at the air as we left. Our plan was to go straight to the biological weapons laboratory after moving through the Chinese North Korean border, but our plans went quickly awry when dozens of North Korean soldiers ran by in their brownish gray uniforms. We were coming out of the watchtower and thankfully we were far higher up in the mountains than these soldiers, winding their way up the dirt road below. They only had one car and the rest tried to run next to it. The car billowed out black smoke and gave the entire surrounding area a smell of burning and sulfur. All the soldiers that I could see were extremely thin with the sunken eyes and prominent cheekbones. They looked like they hadn't seen a good meal in years and since this was North Korea they probably hadn't but they still were armed and far outnumbered us. We were supposed to use stealth to complete the mission, not raw force. A North Korean informant had given us the code to enter the biological weapons facility, and we would be entering at the slowest time of the day, when the fewest staff members were present. We would still have to kill any guards that we encountered, however. Change of plans, Agent Hudson said pointing to a deer trail that wound in the opposite direction of the approaching North Korean troops. There's a small border town nearby where we can hide temporarily, until the military clears off the road. There's no other way? I asked. He shrugged. Uh, not that I know of, he said. Our planned route follows that road. We could lay low for a couple of hours and then come back and check out the area. Try not to be seen by any civilians, though. They're all spies for the regime. These people turn in their own neighbors for an extra bowl of rice. Heck, half of them are eating snakes and rats and grass just to survive. And they probably earn a thousand a year at most. They would bring us right to the torture chamber if they caught sight of us. Yeah, I figured, I said. So are we just not going to talk about what we saw back there? Agent Hudson stopped suddenly giving me a severe look. His blue eyes looked me up and down coldly. Okay, then talk about it, he said. The statement caught me off guard. I didn't know how to respond to it. Well, I mean, you have more experience than me. I was wondering what you thought, I said. The trees around us rustled in the slay mountain breeze, the air smelling sweet and clean. I looked past Agent Hudson and could see for dozens of miles into the North Korean countryside. Quaint small villages dotted the landscape, with dirt roads sneaking their way through the thick trees. 
far off in the distance from the direction of the watchtower. We heard yelling in from a different direction. Dogs had started barking. Oh crap, Agent Hudson said. Let's pick up the pace. They have tracking dogs, I think. I don't know if they'll pick up our scent and follow us or whether they'll catch the trail of whoever actually did that horrible crap. Skinning that man alive and all that. But our trail is fresh, so I'm not liking our odds. He began to speed walk, pulling out the electric compass and reading it as he went. From our view high up on the mountain, I could see a little town not far away. Agent Hudson did too, and he quickly pocketed the electric compass. Okay, I know where we are, he said. I don't need that anymore. So, are you going to answer my question? I asked. He walked fast beside me, breathing hard, a slight sheen of perspiration showing on his face. I don't have an answer for you, Jin Tao, he said calmly. Do I think I know everything strange and unusual that we'll encounter just because I've been in this job for a few years? But no, I don't think that's what's going on. I've never seen anything like that before and I hope for both our sakes that we never see it again. What do you think about what Al said? About biological and chemical weapons, I said. Do you think maybe they tested out some new agent and it got out? I think the most likely answer is that the man we saw wasn't actually dead. He might have looked dead when we first got there, but I've seen lots of people who looked dead and weren't. Even being skinned alive, you can live for a while. Maybe he was in a stupor or a catatonic state from all the pain and shock that he must have suffered. Maybe they gave that soldier some drug or chemical agent so he wouldn't feel pain. But it's not like we saw Lazarus rising out of the grave. In my book, all we saw was a dying, crazed man nailed to the wall. He stopped speaking, the dog sounding much closer now. We had almost made it to the village. It looked fairly empty, though I saw a feral-looking, extremely skinny cat skulking around a nearby residence. As we entered the town, I realized just how dilapidated and shoddy the small houses and huts here looked. The one on the edge of the forest with the cat in the yard literally had holes in the roof and the windows were broken and covered over with paper. No power lines ran to any of the houses. I thought to myself how cold and miserable the winters must be here, without electricity or central heating. As if on cue, an old woman came hobbling out of the house, stooping down to pet the cat. She looked tiny, no more than five feet, and had an old-fashioned red satin dress covering her thin and shaking frame. She looked up at us with bleary eyes, the whites looking like yellow jelly. She had a hunched back look and took small, tottering steps as she leaned heavily on her wooden cane. After staring at us in surprise for a few long moments, she smiled, showing her few remaining teeth spread out in her mouth like lone sentries scattered across a war zone. Are you with the tour group? She asked in Korean and I immediately answered smiling. Yes, we got separated, I'm afraid, I said. She gave me a suspicious look and then she motioned for me to come inside the house. Oh, well, come in. I'll get you food and water. Maybe we can find a way to get you back to your group. That'd be wonderful, I said. Agent Hudson understood some Korean but not much. I translated the conversation for him and he grunted in assent. I'm not eating any of this dang Korean food, he said. It's probably all cats and dogs. Did you know the North Korean government put up posters all around the towns saying to eat dog meat in the summertime because it cools you down? In reality, they just wanted free food for the people and slaughtering wild dogs is one more way to give it. I followed the old woman through the battered, cracked front door of the house. Inside, I saw a home that only someone in extreme poverty could love. A dirty chipped table stood in the middle of the kitchen. A fire roared in the collapsing fireplace. Most of the bricks that composed it were either loose, fractured, or missing entirely. Above the fire, I saw a black metal pot. There was an odor of rotting wood and mold. I also smelled something strange coming from the pot. A smell almost like green tea. I walked over and looked in, inhaling it deeply. 
In the boiling water I saw only grass clippings and a dead snake being cooked together for a disgusting broth. I looked up sharply at the woman who didn't seem to notice my revulsion. You eat this, I asked the old woman who smiled wanly. Oh, when we can catch snakes or rats to eat, we do, she replied. Otherwise, it's just grass and rotten cabbage from the government, along with powdered milk sometimes or rice. But you can't count on the rations coming in. They've been cut and then cut again until we feel constantly hungry. What's your name? I asked. He Jin, she said, bowing curtly. I wondered whether this woman was a friend or a liability. I certainly didn't want to kill her and I also didn't want to risk her running out to inform the authorities of our presence immediately after we left. I could see these same thoughts passing through Agent Hudson's mind, his face turning stony as he looked down at her. I'm Jin Tao and this is Mark, I said, purposefully not giving her our full names. Have you seen anything strange around here lately? We found a corpse in the woods that appeared to be not fully dead. Her eyes widened at this and she uttered a short gasp. We had that during the arduous march, the famine that killed millions, she said. Some of the people who starved came back and they were rabid, biting, and totally insane. Nothing was left of their humanity. They were just agents of hunger who went around eating the living. And what about the line? And I looked and beheld a pale horse. Have you ever heard that before? I asked. She broke eye contact, looking down and to the left, hesitating for a long moment. Uh, no, I'm sorry, she said. In North Korea, Bibles could get you a death sentence or life in a concentration camp, so I doubted if she would have known the reference anyway. But something in her demeanor suggested that she knew more than she had said. I wondered if this was just a paranoia from the stressful situation, or whether I was actually seeing it. As I relayed the conversation to Agent Hudson in full, I heard dogs barking outside and men calling orders. The heavy thud of many booted feet echoed from the dirt road through the village, and it seemed to be growing nearer by the second. Before I knew what was happening, I saw Agent Hudson take out his tranquilizer gun and shoot a dart into her stomach. She looked down confused and then frowned. With seconds, she began to wave around her feet. Oh, she said falling. Agent Hudson scooped her up in his arms as the knocks came from the front door, loud and insistent. Soldiers yelled in North Korean, stating that enemy agents had infiltrated the area and that a search was underway. Agent Hudson ran to the bedroom, throwing the woman down on the threadbare mattress. I heard crashing from the front and back of the house, and heavy boots began to thud on the wooden floors. Without thinking, Agent Hudson and I took refuge in a closet in the bedroom, shutting the door quietly behind us though, leaving a slit to see outside. And we waited for the men to come in and discover us with guns drawn and take us to the torture chamber. I heard the soldiers sweeping the house from room to room, dogs furiously barking outside. A car that sounded like its muffler had fallen off sometime during the Vietnam War idled in the street. They found the old woman laying comatose in her bed and tried unsuccessfully to rouse her, screaming orders at her over and over but with no response. I heard footsteps coming towards the door of the closet where we hid, and my finger tightened on the trigger. I was resolved to go down fighting and not be captured and given a slow death on a blood-stained concrete slab in the basement of some building where the townspeople never go. I saw Agent Hudson's eyes narrow, the scope of the gun raised to chest height as he prepared to start shooting. The air felt electric with tension, and I tried not to even breathe too loudly lest we be heard. My heart beat furiously in my ears, each thud seeming to betray my presence to the enemy. I tried to calm myself to stop the trembling that swept across my body, but then a commotion started on the street and the soldiers began issuing orders and rushing outside. Firing started and screams of agony and horror shattered the small, poverty-stricken town. I slowly opened the door expecting some sort of trap, 
but the shrieking and wails coming from outside could not have been staged. There was too much pain in the voice, intolerable. It sounded like their vocal cords would rupture from the effort, and then the screams were cut off one by one. I walked softly to the window, seeing He Jin still laying on the bed unconscious. I would have to give her a dose of an opioid antagonist to prevent a likely overdose that would cause her to stop breathing and turn blue. For drugs like Atorphin, we carried a preloaded red syringe that read, Revive on, for animal use only. I had wanted to laugh when I first read it, but the CIA had assured me that Itorphin was the safest and quickest method of immobilization, and that this was an antidote that would work on humans as well. As I got to the window seeing the cracked glass panes and ancient splintering wood, a sudden urge to turn away came over and I began sweating heavily. Chills ran up and down my body and I felt unreal, not in the moment. It felt like I had just woken up in the middle of a dream, but when I looked outside, I knew my mind could not have conjured such atrocities in the course of a nightmare. On a white, skeletal horse sat a red rider, his body twisted and dark, his features demonic and inhuman. The hooves softly clicked on the dirt and stones as the man rode over bodies, their faces frozen in horror. It seemed like I was looking at something not from the angles and geometry of our universe, as if space itself twisted around this horrendous being of power. Its massive head formed the shape of an upside down triangle, its crimson skin as smooth as fresh paint. Two bulbous, glistening eyes stared out straight ahead unblinking. They looked like two spherical obsidian stones, as large as baseballs and seemingly without eyelids. They looked insectoid or even entirely alien. Like the eyes of a poisonous snake, they radiated malice and power. Underneath it had some strange exoskeleton, its bones on the outside of its body, grooved and smooth like a red shell rippling down its thin chest. Its legs jutted out the sides of the undead horse, like the legs of a praying mantis, sharp and muscular. The horse, despite having no flesh or muscle on its body, moved quickly. It had two pure black eyes like those of its master, though not nearly as strange. They didn't form a bulbous spherical mass, like those of the riders, but looked like two black stones embedded into its skull, shining with oil spot rainbows and colors that glimmered off its eyes as they caught the sun. A North Korean man ran across the street and the rider on the horse pointed a long, festering finger in his direction and uttered a single word. The man stopped immediately, his eyes widening, the blood draining from his face. He began to claw at his own eyes, ripping them and shredding them, until blood streamed from the sockets and two empty lidless voids stared out. He began to choke and turn blue, as if he had swallowed his own tongue and fell to the ground, seizing and kicking. I saw his fingernails and lips becoming as cyanotic as he laid on the dirt, as limp as a rag doll. As if in response, the creature on the skeletal horus gave out a deafening demonic shriek. It echoed across the mountains, reverberating in eerie waves. The voice sounded like thousands of voices spliced together, some simultaneously fading out, while others rose in a harmonizing cacophony. It made a nightmarish sound and goosebumps rose up on my skin as I listened to the cry of this creature, a cry as alien and inhuman as anything that I had ever heard. I realized Agent Hudson was no longer standing next to me. He had the red syringe in his hand, injecting some of the Revivon into He Lin's neck. Her breathing seemed to slow, far too slow for comfort, and her face looked pale. But within seconds her breathing began to accelerate, and her eyes had started to flutter. With a confused and sleepy expression, she opened her eyes, seemingly not realizing where she was or how she got there. Agent Hudson looked up, motioning for me to come over. I looked out the window. I saw countless bodies on the road, men, women, and children all laying haphazardly next to one another. The creature had stopped its incessant, demonic screaming, but the echo still came back over the mountains, slowly dying down over a few seconds. My ears rang from the intensity of it, a high-pitched buzzing that made it hard to understand Agent Hudson's words. I listened intently, looking at his lips. 
She knows something, he said, his eyes cold and slitted. We need to find out what's going on here. I think it's something far worse than we imagined. I heard the distant clicking of the horse's hooves as it passed down the street, trampling the dozens of corpses on the way. Oh no, I knew it. He Jin said woozily, her head spasmodically moving from side to side, her eyes wide and full of terror. She looked up at the ceiling as she lay on her ancient bed. Agent Hudson looked at me. Your Korean is far better than mine, he said. She'll trust you more than me simply because you know the language and you look like her. I shrugged. I'll give it a shot, I said. I pulled up a rickety chair, continuously glancing out the window, but the strange rider had passed by. He no longer screamed and the silence outside seemed deathly. The smell of blood hung heavy in the air, coming through the cracks and broken windows of the dilapidated house. He Jin, I said, pulling up close to her. She moved her head on the pillow, meeting my eyes. They were wide and very dark, filled with nightmarish memories and terrors that I couldn't imagine. What happened during the arduous march? What caused the bodies to come back? We don't know where it started, but it seemed to come from the forest north of here. I looked knowingly at Agent Hudson, who nodded. That was where the biological weapons facility we had been sent to investigate was located. Directly north as the crow flies, not more than three or four miles from the town. And what was it? I asked. The undead, but not just them. They followed something inhuman, something that rode by on a horse. I never saw it, but I had heard stories from survivors. They said that its horse shone a pale color made of bones with pure black eyes like those of its master. The military told us that it was a monster sent by the Americans or the South Koreans, and that our great leader would respond in force by sending a thousand monsters to their country for every one that invaded ours. But others whispered that it was made by the Democratic People's Republic itself, though they would never say it publicly for fear of execution. And how did it end? I asked. When the famine ended, the corpses and the rider went where? She shrugged. The Chinese sent reinforcements to the border regions, and the DPRK began to fill every town around here with soldiers. Most of the Korean soldiers were starving just like us, and they would take our food by force, whatever little we had. If anyone was caught hoarding more than a couple meals worth, they would be publicly executed. I spent that time foraging in the forest for herbs and mushrooms, and trying to capture small game, even eating rats and mice that I caught in traps. I avoided the town as much as I could after I saw the first of the dead rise to life. It seemed to last forever, but then one day the soldiers were gone, and food began to come back in slowly. We were given rice and then bread, and the arduous march came to an end with millions of our comrades dead. It was so bad back then that you couldn't leave the bodies of your loved ones out. They had to be buried immediately after death. Otherwise, you would come back and find their bodies gone, or meat cut out from the legs and arms. Cannibalism ran rampant, and people ate grass and dirt just to fill their stomachs. But you are still eating grass, I pointed out. She smiled sadly. Only once a day now, she said, as if that made it acceptable. And in these conditions, maybe it was. I had immense respect for this old woman who had survived to such hardships and starvation and seen such horrors unleashed. How come none of this ever got out? I asked. No one in the rest of the world knows anything about the dead rising during the famine. We know that millions of people starved, but even finding out how many was impossible. What happens here, it stays here with our people. It is our burden alone. Living here is like living in a reinforced fortress, with no one allowed to leave or communicate with anyone outside. Anyone who tries to leave is shot on sight. The police make sure you know the consequences of trying to leave, or of communicating with the outside world. They say no one should want to leave. 
because we're the greatest society in the world, the most equal and the most feared. No one would attack us and that's why I think maybe it came from our own people. I was about to respond when I heard the cracking of twigs and brush moving right outside of the house. Moving quietly to the window, I looked outside. The rider was gone, but now a horde of walking corpses streamed into the town. They had blood coming from their mouths, their nose, their eyes, streaming yellowish, viscous fluid out of gaping wounds that ran down their bodies. Deep gash marks, bullet wounds, or marks of torture shone out on their bodies, revealing bones and ligaments underneath. A horrific sight that sent waves of fear through my body. The smell that came with the wave felt like a solid wall of fetid rot, an odor so thick that I could taste it, and I nearly retched. Like rotten cheese decomposing tomatoes and rancid meat, that smell emanated out from the hundreds of corpses that gnashed their mouths, chewing the air constantly. Their bloody eyes stared like doll's eyes, blank and lifeless in their sunken faces. Most looked starved and many were totally naked, Though on some, rotting fragments of cloth still clung to their pale, lifeless skin, threadbare and clotted with blood. Yellow pus and mucus shone and glistened on their bodies as they moved forward, hungry and fearless, an army that seemed to emanate from one large hive mind, coordinating their movements like birds in a flock. He Jin didn't see them, and in her partial opioid stupor, she may not have heard the subtle movements. They didn't scream or shriek unlike the rider, and they moved as silently as predators. Whatever few people still had life on the street began screaming again as their bodies were eaten alive. The corpses lunging forward at the human flesh on the street, falling upon it with powerful jaws. The screams were weak and panicked. The last calls of dying men and women as they came back to a nightmare, even worse than before. Those who died during the famine came back. Mobs of walking undead children who ate even their own parents and grandparents, though many were orphans by that point. The parents died too from starvation, and their bodies were often eaten by the townspeople. Many turned to cannibalism and human meat was sold on the black market during the darkest of times. Women used to sell themselves just to get a bowl of rice or a piece of bread. People would eat their own children and mothers, and strangers or even friends were killed for whatever little food they had. The walking corpses turned their heads towards the house, like bloodhounds who just got a whiff of their prey. As she kept talking, they began to rise from these still bodies that they fed upon, converging upon the front door. A stream of rotting flesh and gaping mouths who now knew where we were. Agent Hudson, I said in a trembling voice, time to go. He had seen it too and we started sprinting towards the back door. He Jin didn't rise and didn't seem to realize the danger. We had to save ourselves and also had a mission to accomplish, one that seemed far too important than ever now. I had a sick feeling in my stomach as I left her behind, condemning her to a horrible and slow death. Agent Hudson smashed through the rickety boards of the back door without even opening it splintering the wood in an explosion of adrenaline. I followed through the hole. He Jin began to scream in agony and I quickly turned, seeing the frontmost corpses lunging forward and eating her from the legs and stomach. Her eyes rolled in pain and horror, shrieking like a banshee as blood gushed from the bites. The undead in the back of the streaming crowd stopped, looking at me while I stood in the door, an M67 fragmentation in my right hand. Round and blue as a robin's egg. I pulled the pin throwing it in an overhand arc that flew past in a blur and bounced off the floor of the kitchen, rolling into the bedroom across from me. As I turned and ran I saw Heejin's eyes, haunted, staring up at the ceiling as blood streamed from her stomach and legs. She moaned and whimpered constantly, no longer having the energy to scream. The creatures ripped the flesh off with their teeth swallowing huge chunks of her body without chewing. It was a sickening sight and even a few months later, recalling it makes me feel sick to my stomach. Agent Hudson had reached the edge of the woods and I was now 30 feet behind him as I sprinted as fast as I could to give myself distance from the explosion that I knew was coming. 
I counted down in my head. Five, four, three, two. But that was as far as I got. A flash of light exploded out of the house, sending splintered boards and pieces of drywall flying in all directions. I looked back and saw a red ball of fire catching the drywood of the house in an instant. My ears rang from the ground-shaking roar of the grenade. I started to look forward again, but I tripped on a rock and went flying. I landed on the grass, hitting my head hard against the dirt. It only stunned me for a few moments, but as I laid there, Still too close to the house for any peace of mind, I heard a new sound coming from the house. In the corpses had started to make noises, but they didn't scream. It sounded like a bloodthirsty crowd moaning in agreement as some fanatical leader whipped them into a frenzy, or the cheering of Roman spectators in a coliseum seeing men slice each other apart. It sounded like hundreds of people enraptured at chanting their death rattle. And then as the fire spread and the house quickly started to collapse on itself, it faded into silence. As we passed through the woods, following a winding deer trail up and down the mountains, my thoughts kept turning back to He Jin and what she had said. What do you think about all this? I asked him, and he looked over at me with an icy glance. Our mission doesn't require us to think about any of this, he said. We're just gathering information and reporting back. Thank God we came when we did. Hopefully it's still early enough in the process to undo some of the damage. What process? I asked. He hesitated for a long moment and then started talking, looking straight ahead and not making eye contact. The North Koreans aren't the only ones to make this breakthrough, he said. Scientists in the US and Russia have also experimented with genetically engineered viruses or synthetic prions that can interact with dying tissue. At the expense of higher cognitive functioning, some of these viruses can keep the body alive or even bring it back from the dead. In our experiments, the test subjects always end up like the people here. Only the lower parts of the brain still function, those related to hunger and instinctual needs. They seem to feel no pain, and they have no memories or concept of self, as far as we can tell. But that's not the strangest part. When our scientists injected a group of recently deceased corpses, the group seemed to be able to communicate somehow, as if without words. Unlike birds in a flock, I asked, remembering my thoughts when I saw the silent river of bodies flowing into the town. He nodded grimly. Uh, somewhat, uh, but this is more complex. We understand flock movement, it's simple science. Each bird keeps a certain gap between itself and every other bird, and so any movement on the fringes causes the entire group to move, as if of one mind but in reality. They're all just responded instinctually to the desire to put a predetermined space between themselves and the other birds nearby. All these individuals moving in this way causes a seemingly disparate group of animals to form one collective action, though this is in no way telepathic or unexplainable. But these undead... He shook his head slowly, walking forward with determined steps, his heavy boots crushing the earth underneath. It's something more, it isn't just instinct. It's like they can communicate without any external signal. I'll give you an example. We had two in barred prison cells in the same hall. Every meal, one of our men would come by and give them raw meat, which they would greedily eat as soon as it was thrown. But something went wrong. The two reanimated corpses couldn't possibly see each other and they never talk. Well, not in words anyway. Sometimes they make noises when they're dying or being attacked, like we heard back there. And it's always the same sounds. Never a scream or a cry of pain, but that strange and drawn out. Ah, goofy, I know. I nodded. I've heard some other things before, I said. I remember listening to a speech about the final solution. As he advocated murder and extermination, the crowd began clapping and admitted that same, ah, it was bloodthirsty, like a combination of bloodlust and adrenaline of extreme pleasure in the promise of future death for the enemy. But why do they do it when they die? He shrugged. Uh, no one knows. 
Maybe we'll figure it out one day, but it's just one more unexplained part of their mob behavior. Anyways, one of the guards at the time was a good friend of mine. I had actually gotten him a job from the company. He was in the Rangers with me for a couple years. He was strong, smart, and had amazing reflexes. A true veteran of a soldier. And yet in the end, none of that helped him. The other guard was given the meat to the undead. He broke the protocol by reaching through the bars and dropping it. The corpse was, so he sat across the room but in a blur. It lunged at him and grabbed his hand. He began screaming as it bit his fingers off, holding his wrist in a death grip. My friend turned to look, standing next to the bars, and the other creature who had been prone in the corner and appeared totally blank, almost hibernating, suddenly appeared and reached through the bars. My friend had his back to the cage only for a second, while he turned around and looked at the source of the screaming. But it was enough. Zombie grabbed him by the soldiers, forcing him back into the bars with its superhuman strength. This man was a beast and he worked out every day, but he couldn't release himself from the grip of the smaller emaciated undead creature. Happened so quickly that no one even realized they were attacking until it was over. Undead man slammed my friend's head into the bars over and over, gripping him by the neck from behind. My friend lost consciousness so quickly, his body going limp, but the creature kept slamming the back of his skull into the metal until it had broke in multiple spots. He ended up going into a coma and dying a few days later without ever waking up. When the SWAT team came in to deal with the attack, they found the undead creature licking the blood and hair and bone fragments off the dirty metal bars, as blank and as quiet as ever. But that blankness is a front. It's all a lie. They're much smarter than you might think. We walked in silence for a while. I admired the beautiful mountain views. It seemed to such a contrast to the horrors nearby. Few people who visited the area would ever believe that a biological weapons laboratory dealing in human experimentation was hid nearby. Moreover, we had been warned before we left that the North Koreans may have secret camps in the area to use prisoners as labor and keep the human guinea pigs close to the laboratory so they could be slaughtered and experimented upon easily and at once. Seeing as the company had access to high-tech spy satellites, that could see a dumpster from outer space. I figured this warning was a guarantee that we would see concentration camps as well. Finally, I saw a break in the trees. The sun had started to go down behind the mountains and a cool breeze began to blow through the area. The sweat on my forehead from hiking so far evaporated quickly and I started to feel relief that we had actually reached our destination. Now we could finish this horrible task and go home. But a chill ran through my body as I peered through the trees at the building. From here I could see the metal door on the front of the complex stood wide open. Across the front wall written in Korean and the same huge black writing as before appeared only three words. Come and see. We argued for a few minutes. I did not want to go in. It's clearly a trap, I said. Why is the door wide open? They know we're here and they want us to go in so that they can ambush us and capture us. It couldn't be more obvious. But Agent Hudson wasn't so sure. He thought that the words had nothing to do with us and that the door may have been left open by fleeing people. Our mission, he said, is to go in and find out what's going on. We have no choice. If it's a trap, don't get taken alive. But with the amount of chaos in this area right now, we will never have a better chance than we do at this moment. We need to take it. I sighed. Stay close behind me and cover our backs. Now let's go. By the time that we broke out of the woods, moving silently with guns raised, darkness had descended. The biological weapons laboratory still had electricity and bright lights shone from all around it. We first had to move through a razor wire fence on the outer perimeter of the complex. It had a guardhouse situated at the only gate. I noticed that this road was paved unlike all the others that I had seen and it looked fairly new. The North Koreans apparently had plenty of money to spend on the military, 
with none to spend on their own people or residential infrastructure. I could see the entire complex much more clearly now. I passed by the guardhouse close behind Agent Hudson, glancing inside as I went. I saw a dead man in there, his face eaten off. His skull gleamed white behind the red, like a macabre Christmas decoration. The complex itself looked massive, I couldn't see the end of it. Constructed of grey, smooth concrete with a flat roof and no windows. It came across as one of the most depressing and utilitarian architectures that I had ever beheld. It rose four stories in the air, but we knew from informants that it also descended another five. What we wanted was down below, as the upper stories were mainly used for bureaucracy and paperwork. The actual experiments and pathogens were kept below, and the deeper one descended, the more virulent and dangerous the pathogens became. Between the fence and the complex, a field extended around the square building, the paved road winding its way through the neatly trimmed grass. Without hesitation, we sprinted through the open area. I kept checking our backs, but despite the feeling of eyes watching me, I saw no sign of anyone. Soon we were inside the complex. The breeze came in with us, but no longer did the smell of pure mountain air and forest surround us. A fetid odor, rotten and thick, permeated the entire complex. I looked down the hallway, seeing portraits of previous leaders as well as various propaganda posters, many of them showing nuclear missiles and ICBMs. We will incinerate all our enemies in a sea of fire. One poster to my right exclaimed, a North Korean soldier's face painted in front of a soaring nuclear missile, a wall of fire and smoke in the background. Agent Hudson and I stopped to rest for a moment in this strange milieu of totalitarianism and nationalism. North Korea had always reminded me of a modern real world in 1984. We have to go to the bottom floor, Agent Hudson said, breathing heavily. I nodded already knowing that. He had a tendency to repeat information in tense situations. I always assumed it somehow relieved his anxiety. That crippling, heart-tightening feeling before a battle of a life or death situation. Lead the way, I said, smiling at him, trying to relieve the tension. We found a stairway and began descending. The smell of rotting bodies grew worse, the air growing thicker as we descended. No longer did the sweet mountain breeze blow around us. I coughed, almost throwing up and bending double. Agent Hudson whipped around, putting his fingers to his lips and his eyes blazing. By the time that we got to the bottom floor, I was breathing through my mouth, my eyes watering. I wish that they had given us some gas masks or respirators. I couldn't imagine how anybody could work here, though I also couldn't imagine eating grass and rats on a daily basis. Agent Hudson silently pushed the door open, disappearing into the dark corridor with his rifle ready. I followed closely behind. I found a long, dimly lit hallway. Down here, there were no propaganda posters, no portraits of the great leader. It felt cold and blank. Concrete walls opened into rooms without doors. We moved into the first room, and I nearly vomited at what I saw. A man tied down to a stretcher and gagged. He had been dissected alive without anesthesia. He moved his head wildly, his gleaming eyes staring back at us in horror. I saw his entire chest and stomach open. I could see the thready, rapid heart beating in the open surgical wound. The ribs had been removed and placed neatly in a pile beside the man. Without hesitation, I stepped forward raising my tranquilizer gun and shot him in the arm. It would be a fatal dose, a rapid cessation of breathing without any revivon to counteract the lethal opioid, as the itorphin was nearly a hundred times stronger than fentanyl. Turning around rapidly, we left the room, moving along this corridor of nightmares. In the next room, we found a woman's corpse, with massive bubonic sores all over her body, Viscous yellow fluid ran out of the wounds. They concentrated along the locations of her lymph nodes, with pustules the size of oranges swelling out of her neck and armpits. That looks like the Black Death, Agent Hudson said, 
Oh, we should probably get out of here. This isn't helping. And I don't want to be near that crap. Can't believe they don't even contain highly infectious biological agents in plexiglass or something here, like we do back in the States. These people probably make a thousand dollars a year, I reminded him. This is one of the poorest countries imaginable. Heck, I'm surprised they can even keep a constant flow of electricity to this building. We kept moving and to my surprise, the next room was in some den of horror. It was an office. It looked like the office of a doctor or a scientist, with posters of the human body covering the walls. In the corner, I saw a man cowering behind his desk, dressed in a white lab coat. He was skinny, with black framed glasses. I looked over his face, high cheekbones and small chin. It didn't look like the face of a devil. Agent Hudson and I stared in surprise at him for a fraction of a second. He used the opportunity to raise a pistol, and before I knew it, he had fired. No, I cried instinctively, raising my gun and shooting him in the chest. I turned to see Agent Hudson on the ground. I ran towards the scientist who now laid on the floor, a puddle of blood spreading underneath his body and soaking into his white coat. I took the gun away from him and then ran back to Agent Hudson. I saw with immense relief that the bullet had hit him in his Kevlar body armor, directly above the navel. It would probably leave a deep and painful bruise, but it wouldn't kill him. He grunted, a sweating now. Dang, that hurts, he said through gritted teeth, breathing fast. I left him on the ground and went back to the scientist. He was still alive. The bullet appeared to have hit him in his left shoulder. It bled heavily, but it didn't appear to have torn any arteries or major blood vessels. I knelt down next to him, putting my gloved right hand on the wound and pressing down. He screamed in pain. Yeah, it hurts, doesn't it? I said. So I want to play a game with you. If you give me the right answers, I'll let you live. And if I think you're lying to me, well... I took one finger and reached into the wound, pressing hard against these shattered bone fragments feeling the warm blood running down around my gloved finger. He nearly passed out, his face turning pale, but he came back to consciousness, shrieking and waving his arms. I took my finger out, flicking the blood off with a smile. Okay, so what's your name? Dr. Lee, he said. Okay, Lee. And what do you do here? I'm the head scientist for the research program here. And are you the one responsible for all the walking corpses nearby? I asked. He hesitated for a long moment. I sighed, bringing my fist back and punching him in the nose hard. I felt it crack under the blow, his head slamming back into the concrete floor. He began to plead and cry. Please, he said, blood streaming out of his nose. Don't hurt me anymore, I'll tell, I'll tell you. Agent Hudson had by this point got in shakily to his feet and walked over towards us. He leaned heavily on the desk, looking down at Dr. Lee with hatred. Yes, I was in charge of the resurrection virus. We had obtained a sample from Russia gathered by bribing one of the head scientists in the project, but I have no idea how it escaped from the lab. We had only given it to a few subjects here. And those subjects are all still here, I asked. He nodded his face a bloody mess, his nose crooked and smashed. What about the rider on the skeletal horse? He looked at me in confusion and genuine expression as far as I could tell. The what? He asked. You don't know anything about some monster with bulging black eyes who rides around on a horse made of bones? I asked. He looked at me like I was insane, and I figured that was answer enough. I looked at Agent Hudson. What do you want to do with this one? I asked. We should in reality take him as hostage. He likely has a lot of vital information. Shaking his head, Agent Hudson pulled his pistol out of its holster. Nah, there's too much danger in our escape route, he said. And we aren't counting on zombies when we made them. So change of plans, no hostages. He aimed his pistol directly at the center of Dr. Lee's face. But we were so intent on our work that neither of us noticed the undead who had entered the room. Dr. Lee's eyes widened, but not at the sight of Agent Hudson's pistol. He looked behind him, beginning to whimper and plead. 
I spun around seeing a small girl missing an arm. It looked surgically amputated at the soldier and the wound still had a yellowish pus and watery blood leaking out. Her eyes though were not those of a little girl. They looked like glass eyes, as lifeless as a statue's. Though this mission took place a few months ago, those eyes still haunt me, and in my nightmares I still see them daily. With a vicious, rabid expression on her face, she sprinted forward, a blur of bloody skin and fluttering white hospital gown. Jumping onto Agent Hudson's back, she began to bite furiously at his neck. He spun around in circles trying to throw her off and screaming for help. I ran forward, but another body tackled me from the side, throwing me over the desk. As my shoulder smashed into the wood, my rifle went flying out of my hands. I landed on the chair, crushing it beneath my body, feeling the wood splintering cut into my exposed skin. Rising quickly, I reached for my pistol, looking across the desk at the blank eyes of the man standing there, a bullet hole in the direct center of his chest. I saw marks of the black death on his body as well. Swollen lymph nodes turned black and purple. Fluid-filled pustules the size of eggs rising on his skin. I shot him in the brain and he went down, kicking and writhing. Agent Hudson had by now thrown the girl off and whipped his pistol around, shooting her in the face. Blood streamed down his neck from deep cuts where large parts of the skin had been bitten off. Oh Jesus, he said wincing. That hurts. We need bandages, I said. Dr. Lee sat up. We have medical supplies in my desk, he said pointing at the drawer. I quickly got out disinfectant and bandages, attending to Agent Hudson's wound. He breathed quickly but showed no signs of pain as I cleaned and wrapped it. You're going to need my help to make it out of here, Dr. Lee said. There's too many of those things. If you agree not to kill me, I'll help you and I'll give you whatever information you need. As if on cue, I heard doors slamming from the floors above us, echoing down the stairway. More of them are rising, and the camp nearby has thousands of bodies. If you don't take my help, you'll be overwhelmed. There are secret passages nearby. And we quickly agreed to take Dr. Lee with us. Grabbing a medical kit, we got him up. I recovered my rifle and pointed it at the back of his head. Lead the way, I said as dozens of footsteps began descending the stairs. I was hesitant to take Dr. Lee with us at all. I knew if I had been captured, he wouldn't have hesitated for a millisecond to dissect me alive or use me as a guinea pig for some excruciating experiment. But he turned out to be more useful than I ever imagined. He sprinted down the long, concrete hallway, leaving drops of blood from his streaming nose as he went. Agent Hudson and I followed him side by side, both of us checking our bags constantly. The footsteps grew louder and closer by the second, and at any moment, I expected to see dozens of hostiles streaming through the door. And Dr. Lee turned suddenly into a random side room on the right. It looked no different from the other biological laboratories except this one had no research subject strapped to the cold table. Dried blood has saturated the surface and the floor all around it. I thought to myself what a health code violation that was, and then I realized with some slight amusement that this country had probably never heard of a health code. The door slammed loudly open at the end of the hallway, but I heard no men shouting orders, and no dogs barking, and no sound of normal human interaction. A cold chill ran down my spine as the soft padding of sprinting footsteps came closer and closer to the room. Dr. Lee frantically ran to the corner, leaving small random drops of blood dripping down from his wounds. I wondered whether the undead could smell the blood, whether they would follow the scent directly to us in a matter of moments. Dr. Lee fumbled with a hatchway in the corner. He pulled it open with a loud shrieking of metal. The small metal door was covered in rust, and it looked like it hadn't been opened since the Korean War. The sound of the groaning metal echoed down the hallway. So much adrenaline rushed through my body at that moment. I felt as if I could see every sound wave passing through the air. Time seemed to slow down as the first twisting, limping silhouettes came across the threshold. Without thinking, I pushed Dr. Lee hard into the hatchway, hearing him fall down the tunnel. 
I had no idea how far down it was and at this point I didn't care. I saw the open black mouse of the undead approaching me. At the front I saw a little Korean boy no older than 7 or 8, limping forwards with a swollen body. It looked like he had died of starvation, his stomach bulging over his naked sticks of legs, one foot dragging behind him crooked and swollen. Red as streamed down his blank eyes from a deep slash in his skull. I could see the bone peeking out through the wound, like the moon is shining out from behind the clouds. As lithe as a dancer twisting their bodies in inhuman ways, some dragging shattered legs behind them, this mass of rotting humanity came at us. Agent Hudson went into the tunnel next, giving me a quick glance before he dropped down. I pulled out an M67 fragmentation grenade from my suit, yanking the pin out quickly and rolling the grenade across the room, and then I dropped down. The fall was longer than I expected and I didn't brace myself at all for it, landing heavily on my right ankle. I felt it twist, an explosion of pain running up through my leg. Then the rest of my body fell forwards and I landed hard on Agent Hudson. He grunted. Jesus, he began to say, and then the grenade went off. All I remember was thinking that the world was collapsing around me, that the sun had gone supernova and blown apart the entire planet, but within moments, as heavy clouds of earth and stone fell from the ceiling, I felt something smash into the back of my head. My vision went white for a moment, warm blood streaming down my back. And then I was gone. Hey, can you hear me? A voice asked from far away. I saw darkness, felt something sticking in my torso and head. I groaned, not moving or responding for a few seconds. Hey, can you stand? My vision started to return. I remembered what had happened and then sat up quickly, causing a lightning bolt of pain to sear through my head. I gritted my teeth, pressing both hands against the side of my skull as if I could keep the pain contained with simple pressure. God dang, I whispered. That really hurts. I saw Agent Hudson kneeling next to me in the dim light. Looking over, I saw Dr. Lee, sitting calmly next to me, his eyes revealing nothing. He might have been watching an infomercial on late night TV for all the expression showing on his face. Air, Agent Hudson said, reaching into his pocket. He pulled out a couple of tablets, pre-sealed in foil. It's naproxen. A leave. It ain't great, but it's the best we have. Unless you want to try some of the itorfen. I smiled wildly at his joke and then unwrapped both capsules. Agent Hudson held out a flask that he had pulled out of nowhere like a magic trick. He pressed the warm metal of it against my palm. It's a little early to start drinking, I muttered my head splitting into a horrible migraine. Nah, it's Gatorade, he said. I just used the flask because it's small and it's metal, so maybe hey, it'll stop a bullet one day. Can you imagine this thin pathetic thing saving someone's life? I took a sip, handing it back to Agent Hudson. He didn't offer Dr. Lee any. In fact, he acted like the mad scientist it didn't even exist. Groggily, I rose to my feet. Waves of nausea ran through my stomach and I grabbed my head again with my hands, massaging the scalp to try and help the migraine. I felt a deep gash on the back of my head and clotted sticky blood had dripped down beneath my camouflage uniform. I lifted Agent Hudson and Dr. Lee. They seemed mostly fine, though they had cuts and scrapes all over their bodies. A thin covering of dirt and dust had settled on their faces even covering Dr. Lee's thick, black-framed glasses. He took them off and tried to clean them on the inside of his shirt. Okay, Dr. Lee, Agent Hudson said in an icy tone, using his limited grasp of Korean to communicate. This is your rodeo now. Lead the way. Dr. Lee did, rising quickly, his nose mashed to one side, his face covered in drying blood. He looked nothing at all like the professional clean doctor that we had found in the lab. So, why were you hiding? At first, Dr. Lee said nothing. He seemed to ignore the question. And then in a monotone voice looking straight ahead down the dark and cramped tunnel, he answered, starting to walk forwards at a quick pace. We followed closely behind. I haven't been entirely truthful with you, he said. No kidding. 
I asked, my voice seething with sarcasm. Agent Hudson gave me a nasty look and then he motioned for Dr. Lee to continue. The last time this happened was during the arduous march. Someone released the resurrection virus then too. I don't know who or why. We'll probably never figure it out. But this time, I think I know who did it. Or at least I can narrow it down to a few people. There's a group within the weapons complex who wants to overthrow the leader by any means necessary. They hope to destabilize the country leading to a revolution. These are the only people who I believe have the motive and opportunity. A few work on the same level of the building as me, dealing with level 4 and 5 bioweapons agents. They've tried recruiting me on multiple occasions. I refused out of concern for my own life, but neither did I report them. They have connections allegedly all the way up to the leader's own sister, who was sending out feelers for what would happen if she had her brother killed and took the position upon herself. From what I know, she ultimately decided not to pursue that possibility at the moment. However, if an epidemic started in the country and led to millions of deaths, if people started dying in gruesome ways and rising from the dead, this could shock the people into action. Government has its own kind of inertia in a way. It takes another powerful force to interrupt its forward march into the future. But any force that can make the population rise up is sufficient to lead to the destruction of the state. The dirt tunnel started to turn sharply to the right and at the end, I could see dim light coming in. As we got closer, I looked up, seeing an opening with a rickety ladder that let the moonlight stream in. That hatch shouldn't be open, Dr. Lee said frowning. He began to climb up the ladder rapidly. Agent Hudson followed quickly behind him, his pistol in one hand. He had it aimed at Dr. Lee in case he tried to run or trick us in some way. For all we knew, we could have assassins or snipers waiting for us to emerge from the hatchway above our heads, but I heard no movement. I followed up the ladder behind Agent Hudson, gripping my pistol in one hand as I slung the rifle over my back. I wanted to be able to fire at the first moment if necessary. Cold fingers seemed to tickle my back, goosebumps rising all over my skin. I knew something major was close and I didn't want to reach that cataclysmic moment. I felt like a sleepwalker striding blithely over the edge of a cliff. But even though I could see it coming, I felt unable to change my fate in any way. What I saw when I crossed over the last rung and entered into the dark world above stopped my breath. Hundreds of North Korean soldiers' corpses littered the field that we found ourselves on. Most of their bodies burnt beyond recognition. Most still had their mouths open in silent screams, their blackened skin cracked and broken from the immense heat. Their uniforms had been burned off, or in some cases, fused into their melted skin. What happened here? I asked, a note of horror in my voice. Neither Agent Hudson nor Dr. Lee answered. They looked around with wide eyes, and as if in answer to my question, I heard the shrieking of the rider from the edge of the woods nearby. He came galloping towards us in a blur, his skeletal horse shining white under the light of the moon. The hooves of the beast crushed the burnt bodies underfoot as it ran, the bulging black eyes of the rider staring straight through us, unblinking. His mouth hung open, showing a huge void. The air around it seemed to ripple as the eerie, ear-splitting scream emanated from his alien body, rising and falling in waves, echoing through the trees and spreading over the mountains. At that moment, I could barely hear orders being shouted in Korean and reinforcements began to arrive, rushing through the trees that surrounded us and emerging into the field. They barely looked at us, focusing all their attention on the rider and his horse. They began to fire rapidly and I pulled Agent Hudson and Dr. Lee towards an opening that I saw in the human wave attack. Bullets whizzed overhead and past my ears, all aimed at the shrieking rider. One North Korean soldier ran past the others, throwing a grenade at the monster. The creature went quiet all at once, as if shocked at this brazen move. The horse rode right over the grenade and a second later it exploded. Agent Hudson, Dr. Lee, and I reached the edge of the woods by this point, and I tackled Dr. Lee, instinctively pushing him and myself down. Next to us, Agent Hudson lunged, covering his head with his hands. Shrapnel and splinters of wood flew past us, 
a pillar of red flame rising up in the center of the field, obliterating the burnt corpses that littered the ground like leaves in an autumn forest. But when I looked back into the field, I saw the riders still approaching, totally unharmed by the bullets in the explosion. He jumped off his horse as the soldiers closed in around him, hovering in the air a few inches above the ground. He began to spin around, shrieking his inhuman cry again, and white light poured from his body as thin as a razor. Four streams of blinding energy shot out of his chest as he levitated in the air, rotating slowly in circles. The streams of deadly light hit the bodies of the soldiers that ran forward around him, firing their guns and yelling orders. As soon as the pulsating currents of light hit them, they immediately went quiet, their eyes widening, their mouths open. After it had passed, their bodies would slide apart, cut in half of the chest as if by a laser. In horror, I saw the flesh of their bodies begin to burn and melt, ripping apart as the light cut through the skin. Within seconds, every person standing in the field was dead, their destroyed bodies falling on those of their comrades underneath. The screams of the rider faded away as he lowered himself back to the ground, his sharp legs digging through the corpses of men underfoot and into the dirt beneath. From the opposite side of the field, I saw fresh reinforcements streaming in, some nearly tripping on the thousands of bodies that now littered in nearly every square inch of the field, sometimes two or three deep but the rider paid them no heed, walking back over to his horse and mounting it with an alien grace. He started to ride towards us, the North Korean soldiers yelling orders at him and opening fire. However, it ended as quickly as it had started, when thousands of undead began to rush in from the surrounding forests, the mass of rotting flesh overtaking them like a stream rolling over a pebble. Go, I whisper screamed at Dr. Lee and Agent Hudson. Dr. Lee was directly in front of me and I put my pistol directly into the back of his head. And if you try anything, I swear to God, I'll blow your brains out before you even know what hit you. I'm not in the mood to be messed with, you got it? He nodded, his eyes gleaming under his thick glasses. He turned away from me and started going at a jog, staying close behind Agent Hudson. Once we had given some distance between ourselves and the field, I turned, seeing no sign of the rider. Agent Hudson pulled out his electronic compass, sighing when he saw the coordinates. He pulled out a satellite phone from his pocket and dialed a long string of digits. After a few seconds, he said, We're about 15 minutes out from the extraction point. One in tow. Level 5 situation is in progress near the border. We need immediate backup. Without waiting for a response, he hit the end button and shoved it back into his pocket. He looked back at Dr. Lee with pure and utter hatred. You know, he said as we began jogging through the woods, going up and down mountain trails and around huge rocks and ancient trees. My grandfather was in the Korean War, Ray Hudson. He was captured and tortured by scumbags like this guy. He pointed a trembling finger at Dr. Lee. Agent Hudson did not look good. Even under the dim light of the moon and stars, I could see his neck wound had turned a sickly purplish color. He pulled out his pistol and put it to Dr. Lee's head, still shaking with anger, or maybe something else. I'll kill you right now, I swear to God. Give me one reason not to. I'll scatter your brains all over the place. You understand me? Dr. Lee nodded, his eyes wide with terror. Agent Hudson, I said sharply. What in God's name are you doing? Lower your weapon, this hostage is valuable. But he kept shaking, his finger tightening on the trigger. I braced myself for the shot, for the back of Dr. Lee's head to dissolve in a spatter of blood and bone fragments. But at the last moment, Agent Hudson holstered his pistol. He slung his rifle back around and motioned with it for us to keep going. I wondered what I had just seen. He seemed like he was losing control in some pivotal way, but he was also my superior. This was only my first mission, and who was I to tell an experienced agent how to do his job? But it still felt wrong. Finally, we saw the watchtowers in the distance, poking up above the trees as they went in a line all the way up and down the looming mountains. From here, I could see for miles. In the Chinese direction, I saw countless lights from cars, houses, and businesses. But when I looked over to the North Korean side, I saw only darkness stretching for as far as the eye could see. And just up here, 
Agent Hudson said, pointing to the other side of the guard tower. I saw barbed wire stretching across her path, tightened around the trees and pulled taut to mark the border. I could easily cut it with the clippers on my belt. But as I walked up to it, checking to my left and right, a swarm of activity started behind us. Leaves rustled and twigs cracked as many feet trampled the ground. Through the trees, I saw dozens of North Korean soldiers emerge, pointing their guns at us and shouting orders. And Dr. Lee put his hand straight up in the air. Please, these men kidnapped me, he screamed. I think they're agents of the Imperial American government. Help me. I saw my life flash before my eyes. I didn't know whether to put my hands up or to go out fighting. Turning, I saw Agent Hudson put his hands up, his rifle falling limply from the strap around his neck. He winked at me. Following his lead, I dropped my rifle and put my hands up as well. The North Korean men running forward in their brownish-gray uniforms pulled out handcuffs to arrest us. And then sniper fire rang all around us. I ducked to the ground, covering my head as the face of the nearest soldier exploded. The others quickly followed, their chests and heads disintegrating under the impact of the hail of bullets. And soon it was silent again. I took my hands off my head, raising it slowly, seeing the still bodies of all the soldiers laying sprawled on the dirt. I looked across the border and saw Agent Stryker walking forwards in his immaculately pressed black suit, surrounded by a team of men in camouflage. They snipped through the barbed wire in seconds and approached us. Nearby, I heard helicopters descending. I looked over and saw Dr. Lee still alive, looking shell-shocked and confused. Agent Stryker told him in Korean to put his hands behind his back, and they handcuffed him there on the spot, pushing him towards one of the helicopters. Agent Hudson and I followed wordlessly behind, crossing over the border. I saw men climbing down from the trees in ghillie suits, sniper rifles slung around their necks. Wordlessly, we began to enter the black helicopters that landed. Agent Stryker sat in the one that we entered, waiting. As soon as we sat down, he congratulated us on a mission well done, and especially on capturing Dr. Lee, who would provide invaluable information to his interrogators. I just felt grateful to be alive after the horrors that I had seen. But as we got evacuated from that place, I looked over at Agent Hudson and saw his eyes blank and lifeless. They looked right through me as we took off, eyes like those of a statue. I want the job, I said. It was two years ago and I could vividly recall every aspect of that interview. The innocence of those four words, the stillness of the gallery, my befuddled reaction to Amy Andrews, the gallery owner whose questions had unsettled me. Her composure never waned. Are you a spiritual man, Mr. Hall? Miss Andrews asked. Yes, I answered. Are we talking about the art? I can't say that I'd be able to give philosophical or religious insights. Oh, don't worry. Miss Andrews replied, smiling. I'm not trying to trip you up. In a way, my question does relate to the paintings, but perhaps not in the way that you might expect. I was a police officer for many years before working as a security guard at the embassy, I said. I have plenty of references. The gallery owner raised a hand, smiling politely. Oh, I've seen your CV. I promise that you don't have to fight your corner, Mr. Hall. I know you're physically capable but this job takes a toll on a mental level. I nodded my head, ignorantly believing that I understood her. I know, I've worked many solo night shifts at the embassy, but I can handle it. Well, that's not what I mean, she replied. Do you know why my gallery exhibits a permanent display of my sister's artwork? To honor her memory, I said. I saw that news clip a couple of years ago about her admittance to the local psychiatric ward. Harper Andrews, right? I'm sorry, that must have been tough on your family. Not as tough as Harper found it, Miss Andrews replied. Her artwork tells the story of her decline into sickness. 
Not sickness of the mind, but sickness of the soul. She faced something and captured it in these paintings to protect humanity. Hearing her speak, I thought Amy seemed just as unwell as her sister, but I would soon learn that it was no delusion. Every night on the job was terrifying, but none so much as the first. And I'll never forget Miss Andrews' parting words as she walked out of the door. At night, the paintings must be closely guarded. Left unobserved for too long, they can well. Just make sure you keep watch. What is this, a night at the museum? I mused, trying not to chuckle. Oh no, far worse than fiction. The first hour of my shift was blissfully mundane. Basking in the blue glow of the gallery's security lighting, a perturbing painting eyeballed me from the far wall. It depicted a lanky, pencil-thin man with frightfully long legs and a pair of white eyes which seemed to follow me around the room, as all freakish eyes and paintings do. As I strolled around the gallery, following Miss Andrew's strict rule of observing the paintings often, I took a closer look at the white-eyed man. I shivered at his janky jaw which hung abnormally loosely. He wore jet black trousers but his monstrous bony torso was shirtless and he was the farthest a man could be from looking human. I stopped to read the plaque beneath the painting of the haunting figure. The exactor. The one who exacts torture. He longs to break free. He will devour mankind. I hurried past the painting, reasonably certain that nobody would ever dream of stealing artwork so horrifying, and no need to guard it too closely. But the gallery didn't exactly become more joyous as I continued my round. They were petrifying. I should have given the paintings more than a cursory glance before applying for the job position. Another painting portrayed a young girl, no more than ten years of age, who wore a bright red pinafore plated brunette hair and a blank face, not figuratively, blank. In place of eyes and nose and a mouth, there was only skin, taut flesh painted with smooth brush strokes that made Harper's intentions abundantly clear. The artist had not accidentally smudged the face, she had purposefully neglected to give the little girl any features. Harper's youth dies. As we age, we slowly come to life. We sin, they know that, they know everything. There were countless paintings of dreadful scenes too. Cities in ruin, the end of the world. Endless infernos of melting flesh. And they were the lucky ones who were offered a swift mercy. The survivors in the apocalyptic paintings were tortured in gruesome ways by dreadful inhuman men like the one in the first painting. I usually have a strong stomach, but something about those paintings filled me with unbearable dread. The apocalyptic art seemed so visceral. As I viewed it, I was certain that I heard the screams of the last humans on earth, felt the heat of the flames on my skin, saw the exactors move. And then there was a painting of the art gallery, the plaque read, Prison. They entered our world, so I locked them here. Feeling suitably terrified, I scurried to the sofa by the gallery's entrance and plopped myself down. I work a day job and the night shift is just my way of making ends meet. The exhaustion of that jam-packed day finally hit me. It was only when I sat down on the sofa that fatigue walloped me like a wall. My eyelids closed. An hour later, a thrumming sound startled me awake. I twisted my head to see a notification on my phone, chuckling in relief. I opened the message from Kara, my wife, welcoming the distraction from my isolated, soundless night shift. But it was an odd message. I was telling my mom about your new job and she said that you should look for another one. Apparently, there's always adverts for the night shift on Facebook, and her friend's husband had a mental breakdown after one shift. He won't talk to anyone about what happened. There was another thrumming sound, but it wasn't a vibration from my phone. 
it was a muffled voice. My head snapped up in time to catch a silhouette vanishing behind one of the gallery walls. I managed to stifle the scream, but I lost my composure and clammed up. I contemplated running out of the gallery, but something stopped me and it wasn't the prospect of being fired. It was those paintings of Armageddon. I rose to my feet using the flashlight on my phone to illuminate the dimly lit gallery floor. That muffled sound repeated again haunting me, a ghostly groan of some emotion that I couldn't quite place, but I knew it terrified me. And when I rounded the corner I found myself facing something utterly inexplicable. The girl from Harper's youth dies. A young version of Harper I could only assume. I trembled on the spot as she took clunky steps towards me with her frail and near skeletal legs. She continued to groan, seemingly speaking beneath the flesh that covered her entire face. I can't understand you. I whispered in horror as the ghastly girl stopped a foot in front of me. I found myself leaning forwards, driven by a force beyond my control. And then the most horrifying thing happened. My cheek twisted to the side, allowing my ear to melt through the phantom pool of the girl's face. I screamed silently, terrified to find that I was unable to move my body or utter a sound. Then with my ear beneath the flesh on Harper's horrendous and featureless face, I could finally hear the words that she had been repeating in a muffled and ghoulish voice. Why did you close your eyes? The malformed ghost asked in a distorted cry. My body was suddenly hurled to the floor and the little girl fled into the shadows. My eyes shot to the far wall and I found that my gut had achieved the impossible. It sank to a deeper realm of fear. He was gone. The exactor was a blank canvas. The horrible entity had escaped its painting. Harper's disembodied voice whispered beside my ear, scaring the life out of me. Find him. He's hiding. I looked up at the ghostly girl's painting. Harper had returned to the canvas, but she was adopting a different pose. Her index finger was pointing at the painting of the art gallery. I yelped in fright, seeing what she had noticed. Behind one of the painted windows on the empty top floor of the building, that inhuman man stood and watched me. Legs shaking, I walked across the gallery to the set of stairs in the back corner. They led to an out-of-bounds floor. Miss Andrews made that abundantly clear. But she also made it clear that I had to keep my eyes on the artwork, and I failed at that. I didn't really have any options. Quivering, I crept up the creaky wooden stairs to a floor that was littered with unhung paintings. The frames were shrouded in white sheets, and at the far end of the room illuminated only by the moonlight which poured through the murky glass panes, I saw something truly terrifying. The exactor. He stood as tall as the ceiling and his large form was crouching over an uncovered painting. As I crept closer, I saw what had captivated the terrible creature. It was one of Harper's apocalyptic paintings, depicting a world in flames, and the exactor was melting its shriveled, unclothed arm with the canvas. Much as young Harper sank my ear through her flash. However, as I approached the abomination, casting my flashlight upon him, its flash had started to sizzle, and it unleashed a hideous hissing sound. At first, I thought that the light had hurt it, but then I realized it had become aware of the guard's watchful eyes upon it. I finally realized the power of keeping watch. I knew why I was there. Cast it away. Harper's voice whispered. How? I cried. The man spun around and I screamed at the sight of his wretched white eyes. They were worse than the flesh and he was far larger than he had appeared in the painting. The entity lunged at me, coiling its bony hands around my neck, squeezing the light out of my soul. I slipped into the darkness and the exactor howled at me, a howl that sounded like a boat's horn. Tell it to return to its cell, Harper croaked. Tell it that you won't stop looking at it until it does what you say. I wheezed, watching flickering images in the exactor's blank eyes. 
prophecies of a direful destruction, a fiery vision of mankind's end at the hands of this terrifying apparition and its demonic army. He intended to scare me, but the thought of such a horrific future only motivated me to keep my eyes open. I won't stop, I said, slowly choking, until you stop. In human flesh, burning beneath the weight of my vision, the exactor screeched in fury, but I thought the world might already be doomed. If I had passed out, I would have left the demon unguarded and free to wreak havoc upon mankind. But in some favorable twist of fate, it released my knack. And I fell to the ground, and it too must have been close to death. I crawled downstairs, and the canvases were filled with paint once more. Everything was back in its place, and the strangest thing is that I didn't hang up my hat. I didn't call it a day. When Miss Andrews came to the gallery at six in the morning, she seemed fully prepared to watch another traumatized guard quit the job. But I didn't. I couldn't. Not after seeing the exactor's apocalyptic desire. Too much is at stake. For those of you who missed the first post, my night shifts as an art gallery security guard are more horrifying than anything a person should endure. My job isn't to protect the paintings, it's to protect humanity from the paintings. Each canvas is a paranormal cell. The artist, Harbor Andrews, even contained a terrifying interpretation of her younger self in a portrait as a safeguard. The faceless child isn't even the worst thing in there. There are paintings of mankind's doom. Hellfire, Armageddon. And then there's the painting of the exactor. An inhuman man tall as a tree, with woefully white eyes and a limp jaw. He and his malformed minions are imprisoned in the gallery's exhibits, and they seek freedom. They long to eternally torture mankind in unimaginable ways. They plot a fate worse than death. I've spoken about my first shift, but I'm sure you didn't think that I had gone two years without another incident. One particular evening about four months ago, a text conversation with my wife took a horrifying turn. You can quit the day job, surely. You're making plenty of money from the gallery. You just want to spend more time with me. Oh, you love me. Well, it is a little suspicious that you spend so much time away from home. Have you got another woman on the side? Hmm, Amy's hot in a squint your eyes kind of way. Now there's a higher chance of me hooking up with one of Harper's demons. Ooh, that reminds me. I just bought one of the paintings I couldn't resist. Crap, I should have told my wife about my work. I should have told her about the terrible nature of the things that I guard. She never would have bought the artwork if she had known it were more than paint on a canvas. After reading her message, I hurriedly rang her. Oh, please tell me you were joking, I said shaking. Are you okay, Frank? You sound weird, Kara replied. Why did you have to buy one of those paintings? I asked. What? Oh, I know you like macabre things, she chortled. Don't be a baby. You stare at those paintings all night. What's so wrong with having one of them in our living room? I don't even... I don't understand why Amy would sell their sister's work, I said. Oh, I pulled her aside for a chat after you showed me around the gallery. Honestly, I can't believe it took you over a year to give me a tour. Such beautiful paintings. Disturbing, but beautiful. Harper Andrews is incredibly talented. But what happened to her is sad. Kara sighed. You just made an offer that Amy accepted, I asked. She claimed to have little attachment to it. She said it isn't one of the paintings that demands eyes upon it. Seemed a rude comment because I think it's as great as the rest of her sister's art, but... Kara began. I have to go. I interrupted, hanging up the phone. It was an hour or so before my night shift, but I arrived early. Amy Andrews was engrossed in conversation with the last few gallery visitors of the day. But I quickly dragged her away from the crowd. Fury frothed to the surface of my lips. Why did you sell one of the paintings to Kara? I asked. Miss Andrews answered in an eerily flat tone. 
I come from a wealthy family, Mr. Hall, but I'm not that wealthy. I have limited income streams and I have to keep the gallery's lights on. Sure, I make money from memberships and fundraising events, but I try to sell paintings too. But Harper, you know they need to be watched at all times, I protested. Oh, not all of them, she said. And that was when I realized which painting was missing from the gallery. There was an empty spot on the wall above the plaque that read, Harper's youth dies. What have you done? My sister's demented self-portrait might be horrifying, Mr. Hall, but it doesn't intend to harm us. It's not one that needs to be watched. And your wife paid handsomely for it. Miss Andrews explained, shrugging. I gripped my employer's arm in a moment of madness that could have cost my job and for all I knew, the future of mankind. On that first night, young Harper was the entity that kept watch over me. I hissed furiously. Your sister painted herself for a reason. Everything in this gallery has a purpose. Don't you understand that? For a flicker of a moment, I was certain that something flashed in Amy Andrews' eyes. Something black. And the corner of her lips twitched, as if to reveal that she were well aware of what she had done. But her mouth quickly returned to its normal position. I pay you to watch over the exhibits. You shouldn't need anyone or anything to watch over you. Now screw this, I spat. I'm going home and I'm bringing that painting back with me. Miss Andrews huffed, glancing at her watch. 55 minutes until your shift begins. I would hurry. I drove home, mind racing with the horror of Miss Andrews' crooked grin. Did she intentionally sell the painting to sabotage the gallery? Don't be foolish. If she were that evil, she could have just left the paintings unwatched, freeing the exactor into the world. I tried to still my throbbing heartbeat as I pulled onto our street. After hurriedly parking, I didn't even close the car door behind me. I raced into our darkened home and started screaming at the top of my lungs. Kara, where are you? In the living room, she shouted. Why are we yelling? I rushed into the room and my chest loosened a bit. There was no sign of destruction, just my wife sitting on the sofa in a well-lit room. Harper's youth dies hung on the wall, but the girl's a ghastly form remained in its canvas. Oh, thank God, I exhaled. What is your deal with this creepy little girl? Kara asked, laughing. I just, I have to take it back, Kara. I'll make sure that Miss Andrews gives us a refund. My wife rose to her feet and walked over to the painting, stroking Harper's featureless face. I shuddered in terror, waiting for the ghoul to leap free from its frame. I assumed that she wouldn't hurt us, but I wasn't certain of anything. Don't come and give her a stroke. My wife teased. She doesn't bite. I looked at my phone. I had a half hour until the start of my shift. Miss Andrews had made it clear what would happen if I weren't on time. I feared that she might do something worse than fire me. She might leave the paintings unattended. I'll get you a better painting, I said. Something creepy from another gallery. Just anything other than a Harper Andrews piece. Please. How would it make you happier if I were to draw a smiley face on her? Kara asked. My wife dipped her finger into her glass of water, and I cried in agony as she drew a crude pair of dots and a pencil-thin smile on Harper's featureless face. Kara frowned at my gaping maw when she finished. Hey, relax, we own it, she said. And besides, it'll dry, don't worry. I walked over to her and seized her hands tightly, taking a deep breath. Kara, I said gently, I'm begging you. She frowned. Oh, I know that look, Frank. You're actually scared. Why? Just tell me and I'll let you take the painting back. You saw a ghost when you were young, didn't you? I asked. Kara nodded. Uh, my dad, shortly after the car crash. Hard to believe it, but I did. Well, I know you believe. You said that you once saw your grandma's ghost, didn't you? I gripped her hands tightly and nodded. Right, so we believe in spirituality. While this painting, I mean all of Harper's paintings, are gateways to 
to something unearthly, and that is why I guard them. I'm sorry that it took me so long to tell you. My wife hung her head and shook it. You talk in your sleep, you know. You've been having nightmares for months, talking about an entity and the end of the world. I knew there was something wrong with you. I... The light suddenly cut out and a wisp of wind like a hissing voice filled the room. And Kara shrieked and leapt into my arms. I shuddered, keeping her close to my chest so that she couldn't see what I saw. Harper's youth dies. The watery marks on Harper's feature of this face glowed faintly in the darkness, a dim white light. And the most terrifying part was that the droplets which formed the smile had inexplicably transformed into a sulk. May I take it? I asked Kara in a whisper. She nodded, face burrowed deeply into my chest, and so I guided her to the bedroom and instructed her to shut the door. I checked my phone, 20 minutes until my shift. I seized the painting from the wall, sprinted out of the house and lunged into my car. When I arrived at the art gallery, the lights were off and Amy's car was nowhere in sight. Fortunately, I was on time for my shift, but I had no way of knowing how long she had left the place unattended. I hurried inside and immediately hung Harper's youth dyes above its plaque. The gallery was full again. I looked at the painting of the exactor. I was relieved to see that the monstrosity was still encaged. But something still felt wrong. There was a churning chasm in my gut. You're not in the art gallery. Harper's entity whispered in a distorted voice. I finally saw what she meant. The colors of my surroundings had started to swirl. The gallery walls, the floor of the paintings, and even my hands looked murky. The world was composed of paint. I was composed of paint. And when I looked into the street, I saw the towering edges of a painting's frame. I was trapped in prison. Harper's depiction of the art gallery, which you may remember from my first post. And I knew that I was trapped in the painting because I could see the real world beyond the canvas. My memories flooded back. When I had entered the real art gallery, the exactor had tricked me. He stood in his painting and everything seemed fine. I looked into those horrible white eyes and that's when its mouth tore open to swallow me. I screeched into the nothingness. Never had I felt such a nightmarish horror before, not even on my first night in the gallery. I felt dead worse than dead. I thought that I had entered hell itself. I thought that I had failed at my job and the rapture had commenced. I thought of so many sickening possibilities as the exactors blackened void had engulfed me. Squirming inside his darkened body, I was carried by the inhuman man across the gallery floor and he aggressively spat me into the canvas of prison. I had forgotten that. He made me forget that I had left the real world. It's looking for an exit. Harper's voice croaked. Me too, I cried. I looked at Harper's painting and she wasn't there. In her place, there was a doorway with a flickering green exit sign above it. I felt the brush strokes of that painted world stretch and strain. The canvas was crushing me and I didn't belong there. My painted form had tightened and I rushed to the doorway that Harper had created, terrified of what might happen if I were to stay in that false world for a moment longer. As my hand met the painted canvas within the painted canvas, my body liquefied and merged with the exit on the canvas. A blackness still and serene enveloped me, and then I found myself lying on a tiled floor, a real tiled floor, choking. Back in reality, I gazed across the gallery and my eyes met a terrible sight. The contents of every painting had spilled onto the floor. The exactor stood proudly amidst his minions, plodding in a sharp whisper. I had expected a cacophonous roar of noise from the apocalyptic demons, but something about the near silence of their scheming was even more frightening. Still in the distance, I could hear human screams again the apocalyptic sound of mankind being tortured in an endless oblivion. The agonizing cries were almost tuneful, 
in a terribly dissonant way. Choral screaming, humanity's horrifying final song. Suddenly, in unearthly unison, the Exactor's minions, smaller versions of him but no less terrifying, snap their heads backwards to face me, as if the brutal bones in their necks had jellied. I screamed at their upside down faces which hung over their unclothed backs. They were white eyed and slack jawed, eyeing me from the middle of the room. They wheezed as their skin sizzled beneath the weight of my eyes upon them. Back to your paintings, I feebly shrieked. There was nothing commanding about my tone. Pure terror drove me, and the exactor could see that. His eyes pierced mine as they had on that first night. In them I saw nothing, the absence of anything. And by that, I mean the end of everything. The end of man and the end of ends. He tried to fill me with dread beyond imagination and he succeeded. But it was the same fateful error that he had made on that first night. I thought of Kara, my parents, my friends, everyone that I love. That was what motivated me while my eyes watered under the strain of looking at those horrid things. Ghoulish voices chittered that I must either close my eyelids or die. I didn't fall for the entity's egregious schemes. I clenched my fists, armed only with my eyes in sheer willpower. The minions retreated first, flesh burning and they scurried backwards, dragging their upside down heads and misshapen limbs with them back into the flames of their painted paradise. And it'll always be a dream, I told myself. But the exactor remained, mouth gaping so wide that it dropped past his shoulders. His flesh scorched. Wisps of smoke billowed from his shirtless torso and raggedy trousers. In one final fit of rage, he took powerful strides towards me and outstretched one of his slender arms. I caught his wrist before those gnarled, ghastly fingers could wrap around my neck, and the pain was unexplainable. It was a deep burning of the mind, not the body. The exactor's last ditch attempt to incapacitate the guard who was standing between it and the apocalypse. I saw Kara. She was sitting in our living room, smiling at something on the wall. I could only watch in unbridled horror as her flesh melted before my very eyes. Horrifyingly, she continued to smile even when she had been reduced to smoldering, bloody meat on the sofa. The exactor showed me what she saw. On the wall, there hung a painting of her house burning to the ground in the midst of mankind's total annihilation. On the streets, the exactor's minions inflicted unspeakable horrors upon humanity. A demon gutted a woman with the protruding bone from her own severed limb. That's the only scene that I can put into writing. The rest are too dreadful. Wait a minute, it's not real, it's another trick. Kara wouldn't smile at such a thing. My eyes ached under the immense strain of watching that unholy apparition. But the exactor caved first. Unable to bear my eyes upon it, it wriggled free from my grip, taking what appeared to be excruciating steps back to its canvas. And when it returned to its frame, the choral screaming ceased. The gallery was still and silent. I spent the rest of my shift standing in that exact spot, eyeballing the paintings before me. I didn't speak and I didn't move. Before I left the building at the end of my shift, I quickly glanced back at prison, the painting that had trapped me. Dread it gripped my heart and four months later it still hasn't released me. I can't stop thinking about how it felt to be within that canvas. How will I ever know that I'm in the real world? What if the apocalypse has already happened? I might be living in a painting right now. Well, there you go. Another direful tale from the art gallery. Another near miss. Just a part and parcel of the job, huh? Since my first shift, nothing has been the same. Every passing day feels worse than the last. The impending apocalypse I cast the long shadow over my life. I explained everything to Kara and she knows why I can't quit. And now you know that I worry about something other than the exactor. Amy Andrews. Something's wrong with her. Perhaps I should speak to the one person who could actually give me some answers. 
I think I need to visit the local psych ward. Harper Andrews, the woman who could provide answers to all my questions. Yesterday afternoon, I visited her at the local psychiatric ward. I know why you're here, Harper said. The woman was slender and she wore pristine white attire. Her brunette hair was glistening in the midday sun. It hung in prim and proper plates which made me shudder. She was the spitting image of her painting. Harper's youth dies. That was unnerving given that she was a couple of decades older than the version of herself that she had painted. The paintings, I eventually replied. Harper smiled, motioning at the seat opposite her in the deserted canteen. I nodded awkwardly and slumped into the stiff plastic chair on the other side of the table. A member of staff loitered in the canteen doorway, keeping a watchful eye over us. And two years on the job, right? Harper asked. I think you would have summoned the courage to visit me a long time ago, if this were only about the exactor. I shivered at the very mention of the name, and I quickly glanced at the member of staff just to ensure that he only stood six feet tall. For a fleeting moment, I thought the nightmarish man from the painting had been hunching in the doorway and watching me. I'm not blaming you, Harper continued. I just want to save time. My sister isn't evil, in fact, she's a kind-hearted woman, and maybe part of her is still in there, but it's not the part that's in control. She longs to free the exactor and the others. I paused for a long time, staring into the dejected eyes of the woman before me. She looked sharp, focused, well. Not at all what I had expected. Why, why haven't you with Amy? I trailed off. Harper sighed, reading my mind. Yeah, I suppose killing her would have brought an end to things, wouldn't it? Yet somewhere deep down, she's still my sister. I'm sorry, and why, you might wonder, hasn't she already freed the creatures from their painted prisons? Now that final question is the one that really needs to be answered, I think, I said. Harper nodded. And do you have your phone with you? Yeah, why? I record my story, she said. I need you to document the knowledge that I'm about to pass on to you. Nobody has ever believed me, but you will. You've seen what's at stake. The year was 2003, and I was 8 years old, and Amy was in her 20s. My birth has certainly caused an upheaval. Mom was a full-time lawyer, and Dad was a historian. They thought their days of parenting were long behind them. Mom, did I ruin Dad's life? I once asked. Oh, you were the best curveball that life threw at us, darling. My mom promised and we chuckled. And dad loved us, but he spent so much time abroad. He wasn't quite so busy or as successful in his youth. So I think that he worried that he had been a better father to Amy. One fateful day, he sought to rectify that. Machu Picchu, he said. Let's go, you and me. What's in Pikachu? I asked. My dad laughed. Machu Picchu, it's a lost city. I think you'll love it. You could paint it. Your talents are wasted on the dull scenery around here. I didn't think that I would enjoy ancient ruins, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to spend time with dad, and he seemed so excited about the place. It was stunning. My eight-year-old brain wasn't immature enough to overlook that. And after hours of watching my father excavate what he called a point of interest, the man finally started to dance jubilantly. I stopped painting to see what enthralled him. The fruit of his labor was a large slab of stone, and it was covered with dreadful etchings of ghastly creatures. My dad started jabbering ecstatically about the magnitude of what he had uncovered. He spent a decade connecting dots between the mysterious vanishings of advanced cultures. They were indicators of a destructive force, a plague greater than anything earthly. He said there were entities which sought to destroy humanity, though their origin remained a mystery. They certainly weren't bound by physical laws. 
and my father uncovered detailed writings on rituals which successfully contained the abominations. He said salvation always came from imprisoning the entities, but they couldn't be killed and they would always seek freedom. That was what terrified me. They would always seek freedom, and my father held their prison in his very hands. He had unearthed something which should have been left alone. When we returned to England, I slipped into my father's study and found his translated text. I had a terrible feeling about the stone slab that he had brought home, and so I studied the ritual that could imprison the entities. It involved detailed drawings and a watcher. But who was watching the drawings while they were buried beneath the earth in Machu Picchu? Well, nobody. My father's research seemed to suggest that the Inca artist in Machu Picchu had uncovered a new ritual, something which allowed the Incas to trap the demons more successfully than their predecessors. If my father had only let it be, you would still be living a normal life, Frank Hall. None of us would be in this mess. But things quickly took a dark turn. My parents started bickering about that stone slab. Dad would obsessively stare at it until the early hours of the morning. He said that it spoke to him. When my mother couldn't take it anymore, she left. Amy and I were distraught and we hated our father. And that was when my sister did something stupid. She destroyed the stone slab with a sledgehammer. Everything quickly fell apart. The exactor and his deformed creatures steadily rose from the shattered stone and I fled the room. It was the moment that I had dreaded. The prophecy which had riddled me with nightmares. I locked myself in my room and unboxed the paintings that I had completed in preparation weeks ago. And to imprison the freed demons in a new picture, however, a ritual was required. As many artists had done before me, I dislodged one of my teeth. Bloody gummed and teary from the agony, I started to shakily etch my name into each of the paintings with my baby tooth, and the most horrifying thing happened. One by one, black masses started to slither under my door. The creatures were unwillingly latching into their painted forms. They were being trapped in a fresh prison. The house fell unnaturally still. I crept out of my bedroom and called for my family. When I entered the living room, I shuddered. The demons were gone, but my dad was sitting in his rocking chair. His eyes were vacant and he was smiling. It was a wicked grin, something beyond your darkest imagination. Blood oozed through finger tears in the fabric of his shirt. He had been clawing at his own flesh. He was still alive, but he didn't move a muscle or utter a word. He just grinned. Amy, meanwhile, was curled on the sofa in a fetal position. She was bawling her eyes out, and when the police arrived, they discovered something disturbing. Mom never left. Her body was found in the garden shed, and she had been decomposing for weeks. I never saw the scene, but I vividly remember one of the paramedics throwing up on the grass. Our father went to prison, and Amy became my guardian. I explained everything to her, but she didn't believe me. And so I kept a daily watch over the paintings, and years later, I used my inheritance money to open an art gallery. I thought that it would lessen the burden if other eyes were on the paintings. Amy helped me run the place, and she had her hands in lots of different money pots, so she didn't mind that the gallery was a bit of a money burner. However, one day she changed. She came home from the gallery with a vacant look in her eyes. A look that reminded me of Dad. She told me that she finally believed my story. She saw the exactor step out of its painting. I couldn't always be at the gallery, but Amy promised that she would never leave the paintings unattended. She admitted that she had gone out to grab some food before locking up for the evening. If she hadn't returned in time, I suppose that you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. The world would have already ended. Anyway, my sister changed over the following years. She grew cold and distant, and I started to see a darkness in her eyes, and she spoke in a voice that wasn't hers. I became so fearful of her and her malevolent smile that I had a nervous breakdown. 
and that was her ticket. Wow, the exactor's ticket. She had me committed to this ward four years ago. I suppose that the exactor thought that without me in the way, she could puppeteer Amy to free him from the painting. All she had to do was make sure that nobody looked at him. But why haven't things already fallen apart? Why did she hire guards to keep watch? Well, she still plays by my rules because I have something that the exactor needs. If it had so wished, that terrifying creature would have driven my sister to kill me, much as it drove my father to kill my mother. But it needs the tooth that I used in the ritual. The exactor always uses slaves to achieve that goal. It seeps into people's minds. At its behest, I'm certain my dad must have destroyed whatever ink and tool was used to etch the drawings on the stone slab. So even if Amy were to close her eyes or better yet destroy the paintings, it still wouldn't be enough to free the entities. It sounds like watching them might be unnecessary then, huh? As long as I keep the tooth in, you can just quit your security role and call it a day. No way that the exactor can fulfill its destiny, right? The problem is that an unwatched exactor, while unable to end the world, becomes freer and freer with every passing moment. Free enough to find me without Amy's help, perhaps, and infiltrate my mind to find the tooth's location. As long as somebody keeps watch, they remain in their paintings. Their real power lies in servants. My dad and now Amy. She visits me often and she only wants one thing from me. The tooth, but I still hold the power. She does what I say. Otherwise, I've threatened to end things. The secret dies with me. The exactor uses her to wear me down, but I'm stronger than it thinks. And that's everything, Frank Hall. The rest is a mystery even to me. I stopped recording at that point and I exhaled deeply. There was so much information to digest. Have you seen the length of that transcript? Sorry to anyone who didn't prepare themselves for such a gargantuan body of text. Amy's trying to sabotage things, I explained. She let Harper's youth dies out of the gallery. Harper sighed. Well, it might be time for me to. No, I didn't mean that, I firmly said. Harper's eyes were brimming with tears. I'm tired, Frank. I'm so tired. I'm only one person. Well, you're not alone, I said. I'll keep watch. She sniffled. And what happens when you reach your breaking point? Maybe this is bigger than us. Maybe we need to tell someone. I scoffed. Like who, the government? You think that would be a good idea? Give the exactor hundreds of minds to infiltrate. It's dangerous enough that your paintings are visible to the public. You and I won't live forever to fight the good fight, Harper pointed out. Well, then we'll keep looking for people to take up the mantle. Or maybe we'll eventually figure out what that Incan artist did to truly seal the lid on these monstrosities, I said. He found a way to put them in the bin for good. No watcher needed. Harper sighed. Well, I guess there's one more thing that you should know. What's that? Well, the tooth, she said. It's in the house. Whoa, stop, I barked. What are you doing? The secret dies with you, remember? Yeah, but Amy's never going to stop looking for it. So you need to keep her away from the base. Harper began. Please, I cried. I don't know why you're telling me this. I just, I have a bad feeling. I looked up to find that the member of staff had left. And that was when the clamp tightened on my gut. The sun seemed to dim and an emptiness filled the room. I know that sounds like a contradiction, but I'm sure Harper felt it too. Her eyes widened. Frank, is there a red Range Rover in the parking lot? Legs trembling, I crept over to the canteen window and squinted. A graying cloud hovered heavily above. Blue sky lay beyond the solitary omen. There seemed to be no other visitors beside my white Mitsubishi. There was only a crimson Range Rover. I shrieked in horror. Frank, Harper began. You need to. A splintering sound echoed around the canteen and I spun around to see something sickeningly sinister. 
Harper's neck had been snapped backwards and her upside down head hung over the back of her chair, much like those menacing exactors in the art gallery so many months ago. In the doorway of the canteen, there stood a figure too tall for the frame. I screamed, squinting my eyes, but it was Amy. She seemed to be a regular height, but I know what I saw for a fleeting second. I chased her out of the building, heart racing as I prepared to meet a similar fate. But the exactor spared me, it had other plans. Besides, Amy was nimble. I was no threat. She had driven away before I could even reach her. That was three hours ago. I know where she's going. The good news is that their family house is in Ireland, so it'll take some time for Amy to get there. The bad news is that it'll take some time for me to get there too. I'm currently waiting for a flight. Tomorrow, the world might end. Cherish your loved ones. I arrived in Ireland after a short flight, but it was too late. The dilapidated house harbored secrets, and though I was armed with Harper's knowledge, the brutish building still intimidated and mystified me. The terror stemmed from more than vines creeping up walls or the graffitied innards of the haunted house. It was the place's unearthly aura, lingering evil from the horrors that unfolded 20 years earlier. Why did Harper have to tell me where she had hidden the tooth? My hypothesis is that the exactor had wormed its way into her mind. Maybe it finally succeeded in tricking her. I blame myself. Harper was careful for so many years. She lowered her guard around me, lost herself for a second, and that was all the exactor needed. As soon as Harper had exhausted her usefulness, she was slaughtered. I can still see her mangled neck draped over the rigid back of that plastic canteen chair. The basement was a lightless hovel that carried a damp smell. I illuminated the cobweb-ridden room with my phone, and something elicited a blood-curdling scream from my horse throat. Amy. She was on her knees, shivering in the center of the room. She didn't even shield her eyes from my light. She only stared into my face with a blank and teary expression, and I realized something horrifying. The exactor was gone. I couldn't see the darkness in her eyes anymore, and if the creature had no use for servants, that could only mean one dreadful thing. The end was nigh. A bottle of hydrochloric acid confirmed that. It lay beside a gaping hole in the floorboard's woodwork. Amy had destroyed Harper's tooth, the only thing giving our eyes the power to imprison those frightful entities in their painted cells. My, my family's dead, Amy sobbed. It was as if she had been in a trance for years, and only at that moment, decades later, could she finally process the awfulness of what had befallen her loved ones. Don't worry, I said. Soon everybody's gonna be dead. The woman bawled and I wanted to emphasize, but I kept seeing her younger sister's neck, the very neck that Amy had viciously snapped several hours before her. It was hard to trust her. How long has it been? I asked, pointing at the acid-formed hole in the floor. I destroyed it shortly before you arrived, within the hour perhaps. Amy absent-mindedly replied. I nodded. How long do you think we have before the world ends? She shrugged. When I freed them as a child, they, they took time slithering out of the slab. They began constructing legions of creatures from the very dust of her house. Harper must have been upstairs for a couple of hours and the world didn't end. They occupied themselves with torturing my father and me, but I don't want to talk about that. I blocked that trauma so effectively from my mind that I didn't believe Harper's stories for years. Whatever, I sighed. Let's just save your Earth's final hours before hell opens up. Listen, I've been reading my father's texts, Amy sniffed. The ones left in this ransacked house anyway. If we hurry, we could maybe. Oh, I think it's over, I coldly stated. Amy's eyes sharpened and her brow furrowed as she locked her gaze onto mine. But it wasn't evil that I saw under her eyes. 
not the exactor. No, it was resolve. The dying dregs of a desperate human's resolve. That's it? What about Kara? She asked. Are you just going to let everything end? Well, what can we do? As we speak, the horrors are crawling out of their paintings. It won't be long before they wreak havoc upon mankind. And we're not exactly artists, so I doubt that we could whip up. I trailed off, possessed by an inspired idea. The covered paintings on the gallery's top floor. Exact copies of the ones downstairs, I whispered. Amy slowly nodded at gathering my drift. Right. Harper's backups. Backups, as she used to say. The name etching ritual. It must be performed by the original artist, I asked. Amy shrugged. Well, the texts only dictate that the one who uses a sacrificial etching tool, their tooth will buy me apocalyptic abhorrences to drawn likenesses. So if I were to etch my name into each of Harper's backup paintings, I thoughtfully whispered, delicately tapping one of my teeth, but then I sighed. We're miles from England. Thousands will have died in the time that we reach the gallery. Amy's eyes widened. You know, there are other ancient rituals that our father detailed in his translated texts. Mayans, Incas, and other ancient cultures learned things that modern people have forgotten. When their cities fell to ruins, these survivors utilized centuries of spiritual teachings to engage the exactor in its legions and prisons. But they used the power of art for other things too. What ritual could save us? I asked. A painting of the gallery, she answered. A doorway to the real gallery. My blood froze. I immediately recalled my terrifying experience in prison, being trapped in a painting that I truly believed to be reality. Harper had freed me from that hellish place with an exit doorway. I swore to myself that I would stay firmly grounded in the real world for the rest of my life, but Amy was suggesting that I willingly step back into that existential hellishness. And how would I ever know that I've returned to the real world? I asked. Now this wouldn't be like any of the other paintings. It would be a portal, not a prison. You can feel the differences between painted color and real color. Trust me, she said. Even when you were in prison, part of you always knew that something was wrong. Can you deny that? Amy was right. A painted lie can never convince a person forever, but how can I be sure? And then I considered the alternative option, the total extinction of humanity. But we're back at square one, I pointed out. We need a painting of the art gallery to serve as the portal. Do you know how to paint? Can you create a believable likeness of the art gallery on a canvas? I certainly can't. I think you underestimate just how many paintings my sister created in her youth, Amy said smiling. She guided me out of the basement on shaky legs continuing to explain things. We had moved to England because Harper couldn't bear this place anymore. But we also moved because I had business contacts in your country. Anyway, I found the perfect little spot for my teenage sister's art gallery. Amy continued her story as we clambered up the creaky stairs. So, what was the first thing my sister did when I showed her the property? She painted the new prison for her macabre paintings. She said that it gives a place power to be included in the ritual. Of course, I didn't believe in her deluded ramblings back then. I had convinced myself that none of these supernatural horrors really happened on the night of our father's breakdown. Anyway, Harper left the painting at this house, along with many others. She said she would do a better one at some point. Do you think it's a good enough likeness of the art gallery to work as a teleporter? I asked. Amy gulped. I really hope so. I don't want you to become trapped in some non-existent painted realm. A half-human, half-paint splintered thing. No thanks. Great pep talk, I said. It really makes me want to do this. Amy opened the door to Harper's bedroom and a matter-of-factly replied, It's not like you have a choice, is it? Unless you want me to do it. I shook my head. Inside Harper's old bedroom, a stack of half-finished paintings lay on her dusty, neglected duvet. 
Amy and I sifted through the pile, eventually finding Harper's early attempt at creating prison. Obviously, before moving to England and turning the property into an art gallery, Harper's visions of grandeur were a teenage fantasy. Fortunately, her painted vision was not too far removed from what the art gallery became. I wanted to do something for her, Amy somberly explained, tearily cradling the painting. After mom and dad died, Harper wasn't the same. I thought a place for her art would help her heal as much as the paintings horrified me. I didn't want to talk about Harper. The horror was too fresh, too raw. How do we turn prison into a portal? I asked. Sacrifice, Amy quietly replied. It's always about sacrifice. So another tooth, I asked. To bend the construct of space, Mayans bent the mind. That's what my dad wrote, Amy said, handing me a bottle of Jack Daniels. I laughed. You're kidding with me. I need a drink to save the world. To travel elsewhere, you have to loosen the connection to your present position in space and time. Amy replied with a deadpan expression. I guess harder drugs might work, but this is all I've got. A bottle of Jack. I planned on drinking myself to death after all. I slugged most of the liquid down my throat, ignoring the burning sensation and the desire to vomit. Touch the canvas, Amy instructed, and repeat the following words after me. Try to pronounce each syllable clearly. I placed my hands on the painting. Miss Andrews began to speak in an ancient language and I followed suit. After several minutes, the alcohol had started to hit my system and I had to concentrate incredibly hard. I didn't want to slur a single letter. The colors of the painting started to swirl and then something horrifying happened. My flesh began to melt. I shrieked, truly believing that Amy Andrews had deceived me. I watched my skin liquefy, meshing with the canvas, and my jaw dropped in terror. It's working, Amy cried. Good luck, Frank. What about you? I murmured, slipping into the canvas. Amy smiled tearily. Every ritual demands a sacrifice, Frank. The line between fiction and reality disintegrated. What remained of Harper's bedroom had transformed into a swirling world of painted colors, but I saw Amy Andrews clearly. I saw that blue, painted tear trickle down her peachy cheek. I saw the blade that she produced from her pocket. The colors had started to mix, but I knew what she did. I tried to scream at the horrifying sight, but my face was composed of a melting and painted liquid. My limbs slowly warped out of shape and I felt nothing. That absence of sensation was the true terror. My eyesight blurred as the vibrant kaleidoscope of colors seemed to bulge and spiral. The painted art gallery grew to fill the room, and my body became sloshy paint on its canvas. And then I fell onto the darkened floor of the real art gallery. Nobody had been watching the paintings for hours, and not that it mattered. After the destruction of Harper's Tooth, eyes were powerless against the Exactor and its legions. The ritual had been broken. Resolving to fix that, I pulled myself to my feet. The world hadn't ended. There was time, but the gallery's eerie silence horrified me. Not as much as the first thing that I noticed, of course. Empty paintings. Every painting but Harper's youth dies had been abandoned by the monstrosities that I was supposed to guard. The girl sat in her painting with her faceless head in her hands. She was sobbing and I felt like doing the same. Her painted form seemed even more terrifying in the wake of the real Harper's diabolical demise. She mumbled, slipping her head out of her hands and motioning for me to come closer. As I did, as she leaned out of her canvas, I placed my ear against her face, shuddering as it slipped beneath her flash. They're destroying the upstairs paintings, but they won't find the apocalypse. Before I could ask what she meant, her canvas flopped out of its frame and softly floated to the tiled floor. My jaw hung agape as I saw the hidden painting on the back of Harper's youth that dies. It depicted everything, every terrible entity, every apocalyptic situation necessary to keep the demons lost in their false paradise. 
Clearly, that hidden painting had always been Harper's real plan B. A more efficient way of trapping the creature is only one painting to watch and only one name to edge. Heart throbbing against my chest, I plunged my hand into my mouth. Pinching a canine with my thumb and index finger, I took a deep breath. Closing my eyes, I tugged with all of my might. The pain was excruciating, but what made it worse was that I couldn't seem to free the slippery canine. I needed a tool to loosen the ritualistic tool. I ran over to the reception desk and rummaged around in the drawer for a pair of scissors. Another deep inhale. And then I slammed the blades into. I'm sorry, I can't. It's just, it's too horrible. I eventually dislodged the tooth. The blood gushed in a free-flowing waterfall. Hand trembling, I victoriously held the canine up to my eye and began to laugh deliriously. I was inebriated and I'm sure that eased the pain, but it still hurt like crazy. The drunkenly stumbling towards the apocalypse, which lay on the ground, I finally saw the light at the end of the tunnel. And then the front door opened. Frank? Kara cried. Where did you go? I spun around, shakily outstretching an arm. Kara, go home. My wife's eyes grew and she screamed at me. Look out. A heavy hand constricted my throat. Not a human hand. I already knew what had seized me. The weighty wave of hopelessness and existential dread was unmistakable. As the hand hoisted me off the ground, the thing started to twist me around to face it. There inches from my choking face was the ghastly face of the exactor. Its wicked white eyes pierced mine, but that wasn't what filled me with horror. Its flash wasn't sizzling under the weight of my gaze. No tooth, no imprisoning ritual, no power. And that ever gaping, ever slack mouth suddenly closed, as if the creature were no longer furious. In its place, the creature offered a smile. The most dreadful smile conceivable. The one I'm sure Amy and Harper saw on their father's face. The grin of a thing that had finally found a way to end mankind. I wheezed, gasping for air as the shirtless creature twice as tall as any human choked me. I had never felt so utterly petrified. I eyeballed the face of a boundless power, a thing older than time itself perhaps. The edges of my vision started to blacken, but I had no tricks up my sleeve. My eyes could no longer imprison it. And then I heard screaming. The exactor dropped me, more concerned with the spectacle in the main reception area. I turned to face my wife and I screeched. Harper's ghoul had seemingly fled its painting, the canvas which still lay on the floor displaying the apocalypse on the reverse side and I could only watch in hopeless horror as the faceless girl merged with Kara's body. The exactor unleashed its boat horn cry and its minions inexplicably seeped through the cracks in the tiles, slinking their slender bodies into the room, morphing their flat forms into full-bodied limbs. I wondered where the cavalry had been hiding, and I suddenly saw why they were so animated. Kara's eyes rolled into the back of her head and her body began to levitate. I screamed in horror, wondering why Harper had turned on me in my darkest hour. But then something incredible happened. Oh, Kara said, eyes still rolling into the back of her head. Now I see. The exactors began to lurch towards my hovering wife and I watched in bewilderment as she flicked them aside. The exactor crept across the floor towards her, crunching the meager bodies of its henchmen beneath its feet. Kara and Harper couldn't kill the things, but they weren't trying to kill them. They were trying to buy time for me. I crawled across the floor, breathlessly spluttering from the swollen neck that the exactor had given me. And when I reached the apocalypse, I opened the palm of my clenched hand to reveal my bloody canine. Writing tool in hand, I finally started to etch two crucial words. Frank Hall. Those choral screams sounded again. The symphony of dying people, but it wasn't real. It wasn't real and that was a good thing. It meant the exactor was trying to get in my head and it meant the ritual had worked. 
I looked up to see a gaping mouth of fury on the ten-foot-tall ghoul's face. Its minions began to decompose, turning into blackened masses of paint, much as Harper had described. And the creatures slipped into the apocalypse, imprisoned in a painting once more. The exactor held on to our world for dear life, screeching under the weight of my eyes upon it. His flash was a blazing inferno and he released one final cry of agony before slipping into the painting of the apocalypse. I ran over to my wife who was lying on the floor in a dazed state. I just wanted to see her place of work again, she croaked. I cried with laughter, relieved that my wife was okay. What the heck happened back there? And Kara coughed. I came to save you. No, I mean... Oh, right, the demonic possession. It was still me in there. Harper just showed me the way. Honestly, I thought you learned your lesson the last time that you strolled in here, I said. Kara smiled weakly. I had to save you. But the evening shocks didn't end with the re-imprisonment of the exactor and the other demons. In the early morning hours of my shift, Amy Andrews walked through the door. I gasped. I am the bandaged stump that used to be her right arm. I had misinterpreted the severity of the sacrifice she had made, and I think that news saved my fractured mind. I couldn't handle any more death. Amy's family had suffered enough. Amy suffered enough, locked out of her own mind for 20 years. I intend to keep her far away from the exactor so that he never gets his claws into her again. We've talked about the future of the art gallery, but there's only one painting that really matters anymore. There's only one that's still fully intact. The apocalypse. And well, Harper's youth dies on the reverse side, but that's our little secret. Miss Andrews said that I can keep the job and she's hired somebody else to watch the place during the day. Somebody that we can trust. Somebody who understands the importance of the art gallery. Kara. I wasn't too happy about my wife being involved, but nobody can be shielded from the apocalypse. No risks can be taken. Too much is at stake. I'm a security guard who works the night shift at an art gallery, and I think I need a raise. <laughs>